All right, we're going to get started. Hey, before we get started, I want to welcome everybody that's here today. There's a lot of people in the audience that represent a lot of the work that we're talking about uh, Monday and today. And I just want every single one of you that works for the city of Auburn um, to know that we thank you for everything that you do on a daily basis, but for the specifically for the work that you put in to help us make sure that we're taking care of the taxpayers' dollars that they give us to spend and provide government for them. So thank all of you. All of our guests, we're certainly welcome uh, and happy for you to be here and, and watch this very transparent process as we go through what our city budget is. And uh, city manager, thank you for your leadership. Great. Yeah. Ready? I appreciate everyone. Steve wants to. There we go. I'm not presenting anything today that I know of just yet. I'll be answering questions, but um, what I'd like to do today, we didn't get to the first two final <coughs> presentations. Um, on Monday, we are feverishly working through a number of them. Uh, the department head, you know, their raise is coming October, and when I said 10 minutes, 10 minutes, <laughs> everyone. Um, I, I wish I didn't have to hold everybody to 10 minutes because I work with an excellent group of people that do a great job for the citizens of Auburn 24-7, 365 without question, and I'm proud to lead this city as a city manager. But what we're doing, as I said, is a little bit different as people are going to be talking about key metrics with you, a little bit about their initiatives, but mainly a lot of the things that they do and how much of it they're doing to give the council an idea of this budget that I'm asking you to consider and adopt. Much is going on on a daily basis. Um, and a lot of the last two years beyond our control with COVID, and it's actually happening right now again. You know, we're a little behind today on recycling and, and garbage collection because we're having some issues. Um, you know, some employees get sick or have family things, and we're doing what we can. But I want to give you an idea of what is happening with the citizens' dollars in our departmental operations and how that's going and give you a lot of data. Again, these very same PowerPoints as we did um, on Tuesday morning. These will be posted not later than tomorrow morning and for the public and everyone, and I'll email it to the council and have all this data. So we're going to kick it off um, with judicial. And remember that Judge McLaughlin, while in the organizational chart, it appears that he works for me and for you, and that is true. Um, he mainly works for the city council, and that is handled in our uh, biennial budget ordinance, but he also, from a department head level, works for me, and that is only on city operational items. So just to clarify that, so we'll have the judge come up, and he'll be first. He's ready. Look at him. <laughs> there you go. One word backward. The old saying is you save the best for last, so I don't know what that says for me. But uh, I always start with a couple of jokes, so here I am. Uh, I do always appreciate and uh, appreciate and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and address the council and the mayor. Tell you what we're doing in the judicial department. I am going to be very brief, so hold on to your hats. Here we go. These are our numbers from October 1st to date for the number of arrests. And as you can see, it's uh, DUIs are 151. These are just regular traffic tickets, and these are our misdemeanors, which are everything from possession of marijuana to domestic violence to public intoxication. These numbers, while they are year to date, are pretty much dead in line with last year's figures. We're basically seeing and handling the same number of cases we have in the last two years. This number actually is down. I'm pretty proud of that. It, it won't be after probably seven days, but. Uh, we don't have a lot of problem with people appealing our cases. The only people that appeal it really don't want to go to jail. And so, uh, again, we're down in that area. <coughs> the parking ticket number also is dead on point with where we were this time last year. Megan asked me to talk about what we're doing new or different at the Judicial Department, and there's not a lot of that. We kind of do the same thing. We hear cases, try and figure out who's guilty, who's not guilty, and go from there. But we strive to try and do it efficiently and correctly, and we try and do it with the bare minimum staff we can. Um, one of the things we have tried to start, and this was an initiative last year, was a thing called Uptrust. And it will let us uh, email or text citizens and let them know that they've got a upcoming court date or a missed payment date, things like that. Uh, the update is we're still working on that. We had a problem with the, the contract Darcy today, but he sent some changes back to them. They haven't responded to them. So we're working through that, but we are going to wind up with a messaging system at some point. Um, the other new initiative we got is we hired a new paralegal. 
Her name was Laura Terrell. She is a game changer. She worked at DHR for, I don't know the exact number of years, but she's got a lot of prior experience in the court system. She's got a lot of experience with some of our officers. A lot of them already know her. What she does is she works with our prosecuting attorney. She helps officers get ready for trials. One of the great things that I don't know that we hired her to do that she does is she works with victims. Um, we have too many sexual assault and, and attempted sexual assault cases in Auburn and a lot of those victims don't want to talk to a, to a male. And she does a great job of meeting with those victims and talking to them when they're getting ready to go to court. Um, she also helps out with producing videos and other discoveries. So, uh, I think that may be, Megan, correct me wrong, that may be the only increase we have in personal services this year, uh, and it's well worth it, I think. Oh, no, nope, that's the wrong button. I didn't put these on the slides, but I did want to tell you that I checked with a couple other jurisdictions that are similar to us in size, but not exactly. Hoover handled 7,500 cases less than we did last year with 11 employees. Tuscaloosa handled 9,600 cases less than we did with 16 employees. And we handled, you know, eight, 10,000 cases more per year with seven employees. So I do think, I think IT department has helped us and y'all have been very nice to fund our software. I think we do it efficiently. I think we do it correctly. And uh, we're gonna keep trying to do it that way as long as you let us. Any questions? Yes, I, I, uh, this is really, I want this a budget question or not, but I, I sat in on some sessions and it seemed like the audio visual, uh, the loudspeaker or whatnot, people in the audience can't really hear the conversation that's going on up on the, on the, the dais up there at the podium. Is, is, that, is that intentional? It, it's, it's intentional on my part. Um, the audio visual, the, the audio system will run you out of there. I mean, you can hear it out in the parking lot. It's loud enough, it'll, yeah. it'll go anywhere you want it to go. There are a lot of folks that come in, and I have women come in crying over tickets. They, you know, and folks get embarrassed when I call out their charge and what's going on. And so a lot of people don't really want me, you know, booming out across the courtroom that they got picked up for public intoxication, things like that. And while it is public record, I, I don't think there's any need to just browbeat folks and okay. and, and broadcast it. So um, when we have trials, the microphones on the podiums go down so everybody in the courtroom can hear and I can hear over everything else going on. But I don't want to leave my microphone out of the way because I like to think that y'all can hear me in the back okay without it. And the only people that really need to hear what's going on at that moment are the defendants and the, and the so witnesses. It, it's, not, so it's not a budget limitation that you don't have the capability. It's, it's your choice. That's, I'm, that, that's my, uh, yes, sir, it's my choice. No, we, I, I, again, we're more than thrilled with our building and uh, it's, it's so much better than we were aware that I can't even tell you how much it's I remember that's the overflow for the council chambers. So when we had limited seating in the council chambers due to COVID related things, that was the overflow room. We were broadcasting live in there with a full sound system and in the hallways. Of the yes, Appreciate sir. it. Any other questions? I, I, I want to ask a question. Yes, Go back to that first slide. That, that slide right there, the traffic uh, yes. total and appeals is zero. Is that? Uh, was that also prior because i would think that people would appeal traffic t tickets or whatever type of traffic violation they and, and that's a you can tell i prepared the slide that should be a one right there that's still a low number i'm just wondering is it because a lot of times it's because of the um upgrade maybe in the fact that you know like if somebody gets stopped <coughs> for violation or something and y'all got these body cams and car scams and uh, cams and all that. Well, uh, and, and I'm going oh, to Oh, uh, is that a different type of track? No, ma'am. Okay. That's our DUIs. This is everything from having a tail light out to making a wrong turn on red to having a suspended tag. The, the reason that number is so low is because, in my opinion, our fines are reasonable, the court costs are reasonable, and usually the only reason people want to appeal a traffic ticket is they just are upset that they're guilty and don't want to be guilty or it's a multiple offense DUI and they're going to jail and they don't want to go to jail. But uh, we had several appealed traffic cases last year that was just a fellow who lived out in Cotswold and liked to drive crazy and he just 
wasn't going to admit that he was wrong and it cost the city a bunch of money on appeal, but he eventually figured it out and settled everything. But um, most of these are people that have multiple domestic violence or other cases where I have to put them in jail and they don't want to go to jail. So they appeal not knowing or not thinking they may win down the road, but they're just kicking the can down the road when they get to go to the county jail. Yeah. I, I, I think it's impressive for that number to be at though. Well, thank you. We, we try our best. Any other questions? <coughs> thank you, Jim. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Phil Dunlap, Economic Development Director is next. Good morning, Mr. I'm trying to get sure I can find me. Megan said I had 10 minutes. I told her, well, uh, that's kind of impossible. Uh, yeah, but, since uh, I worked for her for 20 years, 10 minutes. Then I'll try to. He, he has four slides, and four slides, like one slide and two bullet points could be four. I told her I took speech in high school. And they used to, if anybody took it. speech in high school, they'd give you maybe <laughs> one word and ask you to speak 10 minutes on it or five minutes. I was all. I always made A's and stuff. <laughs> all right, that we get to mine. Let's forward. Keep going forward. All right. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to address the council today. I, I'm excited about that. One of my favorite topics to talk about is economic development. I really enjoy doing that. So, uh, you know, a couple of pictures here. This was the Alvix grand opening, the 10-year celebration of Rapa. I'm sorry, that's all the pictures you're going to get. So, but I didn't want to discriminate against the rest of them. I think the key accomplishments we've had in the last uh, uh, couple of years, when you go back and look, <clears throat> we've continued strong success in recruiting. To understand our target philosophy is technology-based, value-added manufacturing. Now that's a mouthful, but what that means is we are targeting higher-end companies that are in CNC machining or other type higher end activities because they create higher paying jobs and they create jobs for a lot of my fellow engineers, the mechanical engineers. We gotta give some of those guys some work. And so that kind of work brings in the, the higher end technology and that's what you've seen us uh, uh, progress to. In the last uh, couple of years, we had 15 new uh, expansions uh, where we've reached a critical mass where we have enough industry here that we're having constant expansions and we had two new projects that have located in, in the last two fiscal years and our target and this is very important to understand we target a variety of sectors we most of the communities up and down the i-85 corridor are all automotive automotive it's great to have automotive automotive pays well but if your OEM or your big car plant, like say a Kia, if they have problems, then everybody up down the corridor dies of a cold. They get sick. So you want to diversify your economy. You don't want to be too heavy in just automotive. And so we're, uh, I like to think that we've done a pretty good job of diversifying our economic base. Why? Because we've targeted companies that benefit from having Auburn University School of Engineering and other schools at the university. We've targeted those specifically. So you've got advanced manufacturing, you've got aerospace and defense, automotive, biotechnology, IT, and then again, software and technology development. Those are very important that we're involved in those different sectors. And then last but not least, in, in industrial development, we took one of our older buildings, and if you had a chance to go out there, we weren't really crazy doing it. This is an art, I call it the Art Seedman Incubator. If you'll notice, we took some uh, shipping containers, and we modified those, and we took a building, and it's turned into a new incubator expansion. And we're just about completed with that, and we've got some really nice little companies in there, including a very nice little German company. On workforce development, every Monday, you might have noticed in the OA news, uh, at, at the bottom, at the bottom of the top, it has work in Auburn. That's part of an orchestrated campaign through our department, our workforce development group, through Amy Gravel. We've targeted that to assist our industries in finding people for their existing jobs. That's been extremely well received. And so we've, uh, we've worked on that marketing campaign. There's a companion uh, effort called Start in Auburn, 
targeting an entrepreneurial activity, and we've got an exciting initi initiative that we won't talk about today, but it'll be in the future that will come before the council. You'll know about that. So we've got some really cool things going on. I think the second thing in workforce is we partnered with the School of Engineering to create a, a, an advanced manufacturing technical or training center. It is the single most sophisticated CNC machining operation outside of Huntsville in the state of Alabama. I'm not just saying that. We probably got about eight, nine million dollars worth of equipment in there, five axes, uh, water jet cutters, I mean really sophisticated stuff and if you hadn't had a chance to see that, talk to Megan, we'll arrange, we'll make sure you have a chance to go out and visit that. But that is a strong partnership with AE and uh, Amy is coordinating that for us. And then we've also worked very hard on some federal funding for expansion. I'm going to make a comment about that in a few minutes uh, and that is very important for us that we've been able to secure that. On entrepreneurial and technology programs, we participated with Auburn University in establishing a brand new entrepreneurial targeted program to help startups and existing business. We worked with new partnerships. You approved one of those recently, the Sabre Finance. By the way, they just made their first loan. It was a targeted and minority loan. So that uh, the, the CDFI that we created, that we brought here to operate in Auburn. That's called a community development financial institution. It's not a bank, right? Uh, and so it is, but it is regulated through the Department of Treasury. But their specific mandate is to target minority and women-owned businesses and people who have a bit more difficult time securing financing. So we've been working very hard to market that. Caitlin is doing a great job on that. And so we've, uh, we've had several new partnerships we've developed. We're working with local entrepreneurs, the chamber, the university, and then of course the, there was the redevelopment of the incubator building. On industrial development, those uh, projects, to give you some key metrics, those 15 expansions, two installations, total more than $500 million in capital investment in Auburn. Uh, more than 400 jobs were announced with those. Now that's it, ramp up. It takes a little time to do that. On workforce development, through our efforts with our workforce division, particularly during COVID, and through our efforts in doing workforce, you've seen us do uh, job fairs, other things. Working with our companies and, and, uh, and other outside agencies, we've successfully hired more than 915 people to fill openings within our base. That's very important. We secured or generated more than 500 resumes through the Work in Auburn campaign. Those have been distributed to our industry partners. They're very happy about that uh, support. And we've developed specific training sessions. I know Amy and her little team has uh, probably provided more than 300 assessments, uh, which is something very important for a company. Before they hire them, they want to do a different workup and assessment on that individual, how well they fit with their company. And so we provide that kind of service as well. And of course, this is something that's going to pay a lot of dividends for us in the future. We've established relationships throughout the region with other high schools, that includes Beauregard, other high schools that might be feeder programs, because our workforce comes from the entire county and actually technically from a three or four county area. One of the interesting things about our industrial program is 78 to 80, 79 percent people that work in our industrial base do not live in the city of Auburn. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, they commute in to work within our manufacturing base. But they get a, the trade-off is they get a pretty good job. And what's the advantage for us to do that? Well, one of the advantages for us is uh, taxes. And I'll go into that in a second. Let me get this last metric. Uh, Caitlin has been doing all these different entrepreneurial workshops. That's been attended by more than 125 <coughs> perspective and, and existing entrepreneurs. She's helped more than 250 people identify potential business resources. Uh, and last but not least, we work through our, uh, the IDB to help uh, bring our incubator system to 22 different companies. 
And that, to me, is a major initiative that did not exist in our city just a few years ago. It's something we need to continue to emphasize, and we're going to continue to do that over the next, next couple of fiscal years. All right, I don't really have a slide to talk about capital investment, but I do have something to say about that. So uh, I'm almost up, right? I'm going to go to you're doing well, you're at eight. <coughs> because <laughs> uh, I can't talk a long time. Uh, I think to understand where we are in, in our industrial program, right now, when you go back and look uh, in the history of our program, because I know about it because I'm the first and only director we've ever had, and I started our recruiting effort, we right now have recruited more than 6,000 plus jobs at Auburn. And that is the total is $2.24 billion. When I came to Auburn, we were barely over a million dollars in occupational taxes back in 84, 85. We're now pushing about 15 million. Now, and all that comes out of your industrial sector, but a substantial portion does. About $225 million uh, is in industrial payrolls. So that's about 2.25 million in occupational taxes. The key point to remember is that money turns over multiple times. Those payrolls help drive our economy. When you look at primary economic generators, we have the university. We've always said that. And for years, the university gave us a stable economy. But it does not allow us to have money to spend for all kind of other projects we would like to have. And so by diversifying the economy, which we started years ago, and we continue to do that, through aggressive recruiting of the right companies that are technology value added, we've been able to, to increase the occupational tax, we've been able to support more other activities like uh, uh, parks and recreation, other kind of things that we like to support, and those are very important for us for quality of life, for us to be able to win in recruiting. So I think it's important to understand that for us to continue recruiting, what do we have to have? We have to have places to put them. And so the major thing that I have within our, our uh, CIP is in 23 and 24, at 3 million and 23, 2.5 million, I think, in 24, which is a total of 5.5 five to buy new property that would enable us to continue our recruiting effort. Uh, we're still working on finalizing uh, those, and was not yet ready to talk about it, but those will all come before the council right making at some, at some point in time. And so it's a, it, it is absolutely important if we want to continue successful recruiting that we, we put that land into the hands of the industrial board. One last comment. I mentioned earlier about the uh, $3 million. We got $3 million through Congressman Rogers' office as a result of our presence in Washington. We had a group there, and, and it's the only reason we got that money. At the 11th hour, they told us we had a chance for a major uh, improvement through Congressman Rogers' office, and we, we submitted that and we received that. That's a huge impact for us because that new business center going in the ACDI complex is part of our partnership with the School of Engineering. It will provide training space, classroom space, and opportunities for us to hold key conferences dealing with industrial and with economic development and engineering-based activities. So I wanted to make that point. Uh, we didn't ask the council to fund that. We were able to identify that through the support, through, and I appreciate the city manager giving us opportunity to submit that, that package. And that's my quick presentation. I hope I wasn't too boring. So uh, I'll be glad to try to answer questions. Philip, when companies are looking at Auburn to come here, what's the, what are the top, top couple of things that they're looking for when they want in making a decision to come to, to Auburn? That's very good. I mean, there's the traditional theories of location. They want to be close to their customer. They want to be, uh, cheap power, they want to have good power, they want to have good labor. Those are traditional theories. But one of the things that really helps us, being on the 85 corridor, having the presence of the university gives us a big advantage. 
one thing that everyone, and, and it's because you've had the vision to allow us to do this, we have the former president of the university on the IDB, and we have the current president of the university on the IDB. I've talked to Chris, he intends to stay on the industrial board. He really enjoys it. He sees the value of working together closely to recruit business. But those factors, they want to have a quality of life. I don't want to leave out the fact that we have outstanding public schools. All the things that make us a great community for our citizens also make us attractive for the right for certain kind of companies. If we're recruiting technology-based companies, we're recruiting people that uh, have a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, managers. They want to live in a community where they have good schools, good recreation, good shopping, proximity to other things that are important to them. And of course, with a university, it adds a quality of life. University towns are in a different class by themselves. And uh, I know that some have worked in bigger cities as well. I'll That's awesome. Thank you. Anything else? Phil, with your property uh, ask needs, are, are we to the point where we physically cannot bring on another industry? How close are we're we? Very close. Uh, we're very close. We're very close. We are, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a, 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 I'll go ahead and say this. We are shortlisted for a major project right now. I had one in Steve's office today, didn't I, Steve, that is uh, something that's special that, uh, uh, that could be a, a big win for us if it finalizes like we think it will. But we, we're in a position where we've utilized the property we've been given. We have only one or two small lots. It takes me about 12 to 14 months once we secure something to engineer it and bring it online, get it done properly. So, yes, we need... It's not something that we need to work that we need to do four years now. We need to do it now if we want to compete because the projects that we meet today or identify today, it takes about a year to two, and sometimes maybe, maybe less, before they're ready to make a commitment. And it's a process you go through. And you're competing, you know. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're in a sales job. We're competing with other communities. And what is our product? Our product is hard. And we have to make sure that we have the right tools that we can win. And right now, we're close to not having those tools. I'm just being honest with you. So. I would like to comment, um, throughout the pandemic, your team did an excellent job of when we had a couple of companies that had to lay off in, in backfilling and, and actually pushing forward um, above that, that uh, loss of jobs. And, and through a pandemic, that's impressive. So, I appreciate you saying that because I almost forgot to say that myself, and I'd be remiss if you hadn't said that. Really, that would have been really mad at me. But what I'm really proud of our staff, we were there every single day during the pandemic, and a lot of city employees were. That's what's amazing about our community. Our job, though, our industries were all deemed, most of them were deemed critical industries and were working. And then when we had problems, had to get uh, support. We, uh, we worked out an arrangement with the EMC to do testing. We did a lot of things during that process, and it's because we have an outstanding staff and their willingness. And Think about how nervous you can be in a big room with uh, having a job fair at the height of the pandemic when we had the bad COVID. Uh, and everybody's wearing a mask. Uh, that's, what, that's what I call it, the good COVID the bad COVID. It's all my relative, I guess. But, uh, yes, we're all working here at that time. Any other questions? Thank you, Bill. If I can do anything else, let me know. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Appreciate your time. Yeah. All right, next we have Katrina Cook and Environmental Services. It is on page 149, just at the very top. It says industrial property acquisition. If council will note if, if you're wanting to look at their departmental budgets while they're talking, which they're really not talking about their budgets, just their service delivery, there is a note in the lower right corner of the page number that starts their departmental budgets. Okay, sorry, Katrina. No problem. Thank you, Megan. Um, one of the big things I want to talk to you guys about today is uh, trash. So, uh, I'm a Charles Barkley of our local government. Uh, so <laughs> 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 With that said, environmental services 
does a lot more than uh, just talk trash. Um, we administrate, um, we administer our integrated solid waste management system, which uh, concentrates a lot on recycling. And uh, for those of you that are on Wednesdays and Thursdays around this week, you will experience our delay. So I apologize in advance. I think Megan may know that. We also provide animal control and care um, program that is attended to both the animal and human element. Um, and on top of that, we administer the city's vehicle and equipment replacement and repair um, program. So um, our fire trucks, police cars, garbage trucks, floors, all of those are So some of the highlights of our um, solid waste and recycling commodities and our recycling commodities will be what is in blue cart are highlighted um, here. So you'll see that uh, in 2020, we collected almost 16,000 tons. And in 2021, we had 17,000 tons. Um, we had an increase of 673 customers. Um, and to put that in perspective, in 2010, we had about 12,000 customers. We've been doing this with the same amount of employees um, that we've had all along. Um, we have 17,188 um, solid waste customers, and 14,000 of those also have recycling carts. That's a million point eight stops that we're doing with our trucks. So when we tell you that our trucks are down and so forth, that's because they're making a lot of stops during the day. So I just kind of want y'all to keep that in perspective. Um, our goal limit on service complaints is 0.25 of the total number um, of complaints that we received. And um, this past year, we only had about 863. So that was good. Where it was our fault? Well, we missed you. We didn't put it out late. All of those things that it was our fault. Um, so I want to say we have a great staff that is doing the work that we do. Um, they come out to your house every week, and uh, they look forward to seeing you. And a lot of times, they're uh, COVID, um, they were the only people that were visiting um, the houses and a lot of people would come out and welcome us and, and greet us with some, some water, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we completed 3,700 work orders through City Works and uh, <coughs> conducted 14 workshops and presentations for various organizations with um, showing them how to optimize their waste diversion program that they have. Um, this past year, we recycled over 5.6 million pounds of recyclables, which is 608,000 pounds more than our goal. And this year, we'll be celebrating 35 years of curbside recycling. Uh, that will be December 14th. So I want to give a shout out to Al Davis, <laughs> who's sitting in the back, our previous director. Our Recycling Green Waste Division, which is our trash, um, we transition from the two-man truck in the process to the one-man truck that way we have more trailers on the road and everyone can have their own vehicle this helps us so you'll see here 70% um, of that material that we collected the 12.6 um, tons that we collected 12,600 tons that we collected um, is ground into mulch and uh, used for landfill cover. We also conducted our trash amnesty post trees, and we had over 2,100 tons of local yard debris um, collected. We also do household hazardous waste day. Um, these are things that can't go in your garbage or your trash. Um, we have a special company that comes in the town in the spring and in the fall, <coughs> and we've enjoyed being able to provide that service with over 1,300 participants. So it's a great program. Everyone always looks forward to seeing it line up Donahue and Cedric has been very helpful with providing us with uh, police help to get people guided in and so forth. So I just want to say thank you for that. Our animal control division, um, when you see our staff there, <laughs> they look intimidating, don't they? <laughs> um, they completed over 1,200 work orders in City Works and uh, we did have a wildlife management seminar in Town Creek Park. And um, it is online, and you can see it on our website. Um, and we handled over 300 animals by capture and issued 116 citations and warnings. Um, in our process, we, we like to return animals home, especially if we know where they belong. So we will fix, fix fences, we will call people, hold the animals just so they don't have to go to the Humane Society, because we want to make things a little bit lighter on the 
Humane Society, but we also want to educate the public on how to <coughs> better take care of the animals that they leave there. Um, we conducted some wildlife trappings, and um, we also handled 29 dog bites. Um, most of the issues we're having now are animal cruelty, and um, it's not because people don't know, but it's just because people leave animals unattended with, without housing or water, and they're gone for several days, and, and that becomes an issue. In the, in the winter, we provide dog houses, and that's a partnership that we have with the Weekend Humane Society to go pick up a dog house if someone needs it, and provide that extra support service that a lot of people don't have access to. Um, 46 six sick and injured animals we, we collected and we take those to the vet and of course that owner is responsible for taking care of that vet bill. Mm -hmm. Our fleet services division maintains over 756 vehicles and equipment. Um, I like to think of us as, as having the second most important, well the third most important product outside of people, buildings, we have equipment and it's worth over $25 million. And we have 10 employees with over 60 automotive, automotive service excellence certifications and 148 years of experience total with the city. So that is commendable to me with our community services division. Um, this year, we renewed our third year as Blue Seal Excellence Recognition Program. And um, what that means is that all of our mechanics are Blue Seal certified. So they all have certifications. So if you have brake repairs or a fire truck has some issues, we have someone that is certified that can deal with that. So not only do they have to know how to work on a fire truck, they also have to know how to work on a tractor. So our, our mechanics are very first, very mm -hmm. um, educated when it comes to dealing with those. We completed over 2,500 service <coughs> repairs. And in 2021, I thought this was an interesting fact. We traveled the city's fleet over 2.8 million miles, which is 106 times around the globe, and spent 137,000 hours on the road. That's the average of almost 6.9, um, 6,900 miles per vehicle, and the longest trip by one vehicle was 285 miles. So I just thought that was interesting, a little interesting tidbit to share. Y'all have any questions for me? Did I, I do with well, me? I, I, I got a question. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm talking specifically about my my neighborhood. I think I think, and it may be some other neighborhoods too. But I think uh, the problem with separation of the garbage, the trash, and the debris, and all of that, uh, help us. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma all of it together, and then I don't think I don't. I don't even mean I don't even think I know how to how to separate everything that y'all pick it up because sometimes you know we I feel call and say hey they forgot to get this 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 and then I find out that we didn't have it in the right spot or I don't know. Yes, we we will we will send some additional um, material out and you know that you have to have. Me away from mailboxes, um, basketball goals, um, a number of things. They have to be three feet away in order for us to access. We can't have parked cars. Um, so we can get some more information out to, to everyone. Because now everybody has a couple of cars, and we've been doing that. Um, so we'll make sure that we, we target some, some some more areas that you need necessary. Okay. And, and the other thing, what happened to all the cats on that street? <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of stray cats. They all gone. They do that with snakes and rats and all that kind of stuff. I want to see some of them gone. But all of them gone. <laughs> well, you know, you had a new house that kind of right? So that all the cats are no longer there. <laughs> I seen the snake the other day. I missed the cats. Uh, <laughs> they over there with you. Oh, okay, okay. That's what it is. Little <laughs> man, please. At least two of them. The train of these numbers are dizzying. And uh, thank you for what your folks do every day in all weather. And uh, they get out there and get after it. So we're grateful. Well, thank you. And I would just like to say that um, we have a great group of folks that work here. And they were very, very excited about the new building that's coming up on our road. And we look forward to it. And I appreciate all of y'all's support.
Y'all don't have late hours though. Y'all y'all guys start in the early in the morning and then after that, probably about ten everything. No, sometimes we have work past that. Um, they our hours Monday through Thursday, six AM to four PM are garbage, trash and recycling. Um, today they are still out there working, so they will work past four o'clock. Sometimes you'll see them Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It depends. She's got different people deployed. Um, we have different, you know, the, the dumpsters are <coughs> near here. There are issues on game day weekends with extra trash and garbage piling up. Public work gets after. I mean, there's a lot that goes on after those hours, and they will work overtime, especially when we have um, challenges with coverage due to things beyond the, the control of ourselves or our employees extra employees the employees will pick up they've also done things like help mow right of way some of them take on extra overtime at their choice to help other departments so a bunch of hard-working people they'll do anything it takes to help serve our citizens i love the care they they show when like when i drive through our neighborhood i often see um, someone out sweeping where they picked up the the waste the trash and they sweep it and make sure that it's clean and left um, better than probably was when they got there and what? I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. That is that is actually my rule as a director is to leave things better than the way that we found it. Um, so that's why we're here and that's our purpose. Okay. Thank you. I'll do a great job. Thank you. Great. Next we have, oh do you have a question? I have a question for you. Sure. Where's the funding for the Humane Society? So it is on um, page 76. That is in the Environmental Services Animal Control Division budget under agency support at the bottom of the, the numbers right there. And there's a footnote that says it's the Humane Society. That's a contractual service for the city. And not an that, it's agency. not an outside agency because that's a service we provide. We contract with them to, to be that animal center. Okay. And is that based on their request or? That is based on their request. Um, we we have a pro rata share. We share um, that facility with the city of Opelika. Right. So the city of Opelika has a pro rata share that they that we pay that they pay and we pay ours, which is a two hundred one thousand dollars. And it's based on animals picked based up. Based on the num number There's of animals, and this is uh, six hundred eighty nine. Six eighty nine, real number, or is that a projected number? Or? It is a real number. It is a real number for the nine months that they just sent us. Um, each each month, um, Mayor Andrews and, and City Manager Crouch um, receive a report from the director, the executive director of the Weekend Humane Society, and they provide us those numbers. Thank you. Yes, the goal is to pay them for the service they're providing directly by the intake. And then we also gave them the land years ago, <coughs> among other things, and helped them building. And we provide uh, transport support services uh, for animals that are there that need that care or anything else because we do have a van that is equipped for that. Next we have the Auburn Public Library, Tyler Wood. This starts page 78 in your document. This is the part one. You're fine. <laughs> I just want to make sure we get everybody in and it's not nine o'clock and the council's looking at me like everybody's doing great. So we went into fiscal year 21 knowing that we needed to make changes at the library to continue providing Auburn with the level of service that it deserves. And we began having conversations internally and with our patrons. And we realized that through creativity and hard work, we could make a substantial improvement without the need to renovate at Batch Avenue. So we made plans and we carried those out in fiscal year 21. And as part of this process, we asked ourselves, where would things be if we had a blank slate? So we moved just about everything. And we performed this work in-house, achieved a much greater efficiency in our use of space, and we kept the focus on current community needs. And next, programs for children play a critical role in our efforts to be a literacy and learning leader in the community. And going into 21, we recommitted to providing all that we could within our means at the library. 
including a robust slate of live story times, puppet shows, and guest performers. We also had to acknowledge that not everyone could come to the library and enjoy these programs for a variety of reasons. So we had to work toward eliminating barriers to attendance. And in October of 2020, we began hosting outdoor programs to large crowds, and we implemented virtual options to assure that we were able to reach a wide audience. Further, we remain committed to exploring opportunities for increased engagement through, through listening to attendees and gathering their input. And we're excited to view 23-24 as a year of program expansion. With the growth we're experiencing in Auburn, the library must meet patrons where they are. And that means we have to devote resources to going out, finding our audience, and supporting it through a host of partnerships. In fiscal year 21, we launched APL at Boykin. This service includes a micro library where patrons can pick up requests and drop off materials. There's a browsing collection for easy access, and we also provide weekly technology sessions for the senior group and residents. We also plan to introduce other components to this visit. This summer, we've also added a family story time at Boykin, and we hope that this is just the first step in providing outstanding library programs to residents in the vicinity. Meanwhile, we're continuing to develop our partnership with Auburn City Schools. As part of third grade Reading Dragons, our programming specialists visit all 37 classrooms each month to perform story times and promote literacy. And we do this in third grade because it's a critical time for young readers in that many of those who are not reading at grade level by the end of third grade don't catch up. And this is especially important to us and we're very proud of this program because school personnel have called our programming specialist heroes for the work they do here. And that means a lot to us that they feel that way about a library program. The same staff also hosts the Voluntary Litwitz book group for seventh or ninth grades. And we hope to make this program more robust in keeping with requests we've received from the schools. On from there, we'll continue growing with our users and developing outreach initiatives to meet the needs of a variety of remote groups, including daycares, Head Start, and local assisted living facilities. Our desire to be in tune with our community extends beyond programs to the collections that support the various <coughs> interests of a diverse offer. For all libraries, space is an ongoing discussion and we have to ensure we're regularly recalibrating to make the most of the space we have available. As part of this, we believe that the requests our patrons provide to us come first. And to help us maintain variety in our collections, we encourage you to reach out to us however they prefer and let us know what kinds of resources are meaningful to them. The question of how effectively we're managing collections at the library is about turnover, and we pride ourselves on doing more with less. I'd like to call attention to a metric here that has to do with our collection size versus our circulation. The Elder Public Library currently holds about 1.2 volumes per capita, with the state average being 1.8. And we, at the same time, are doing 6.2 circulations per capita, with the state average being 4.3. This illustrates that even though our collections are smaller, they experience robust circulation. Our focus on community input is yielding a high return on investment with collection spending, and this is thanks to the decisions being made every day by our materials management team with regard to what we should and should not purchase. We've also included here some pandemic insights. In fiscal year 21, we circulated 460,045 items 84,069 of those being digital. And in the early period of the pandemic, we saw a 111% rise in digital circulation as part of an overall 270% increase over the last five years. Our ebook collection is targeted as an area of further growth, and we work to satisfy all requests despite the cost and other complications. For example, licensing ebooks in libraries is more costly than consumer licenses and rules can vary by publisher. We also have to be mindful of the reality that a small part of our circulation is digital. In fact, only 18% in fiscal year 24. So physical books are still the primary means through which we deliver resources to the Auburn community. Program attendance was strong during fiscal 21 and we experienced an outstanding summer season 
We returned to the schools in fall of 2022 and served around 800 students monthly across the 37 third grade classrooms, with around 100 students participating in liquids. Our recent summer learning challenge kickoff saw 560 attendees, and that exceeded all expectations we had for the program. And as an update to the next point, as of June 13, we had exceeded our goal of 1,000 registrations for the summer learning challenge, and the busiest months are still to come. As we launch the summer learning challenge this year, we're seeing old friends and new faces in unprecedented numbers in the library to browse collections, to attend programs, and to experience the joy of learning together. This speaks to the enduring <coughs> importance of the library as place in Auburn. And we're honored to have opportunities every day to put our community at the heart of all we do. We thank you for your attention and your support. Are there any questions? I know we touched on it on the first day um, as a um, item in the budget of, of a mobile library. Yes, ma'am. Will you tell us just a brief little bit about that and what your vision is for that? Sure. So we have asked for a van that we can use to begin making visits to the assisted living facilities, daycares, Head Start, and also to service APL and Boykin and start doing more pop-up library events there, like library card signups, raising awareness, that sort of thing, and providing programs. And the van would allow us to travel with materials so we can check things out and, and allow people to return items right there. And as the city grows and spreads out, it's more important for us to do this because we can't be in terms of facilities everywhere we need to be. So with that in place, we would like to start exploring partnerships, maybe with neighborhoods, with homeowners associations, things like that, so we can be present where people would like to have library resources. That's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have a question? Tyler, I've said this before. I just respect and appreciate the nerve center of energy and activity that the library provides in this community. The involvement of a library and what it used to be and what it is today is um, so exciting and I appreciate your enthusiasm and your, your employees' enthusiasm. Y'all offer great customer service and uh, you're genuinely happy to see people. They come to the yes, sir. So, and I, as a closing remark, I would make one more comment about how astonished we are by this return both in circulation and program attendance after the 2020 COVID slump. We've returned to levels beyond where we were before in both cases. So that was very, very rewarding. Thank you, Tyler. All right now we've got Dan Ballard. He's our interim public works director. And he's page 66. left on my tablet for 10 minutes so <laughs> I want to give my presentation uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today I want to say thank you first of all for the opportunity just to highlight just some of the great work that the men and women of public works do day in and day out they do it every day in all weather conditions sometimes day and night so when it's hot out there and it's 105 they're out there when it's sub 20 they're out there uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the great work that they do uh, quite simply, I've always been told if you can't say what you do in five words or less, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, so quite simply, we maintain city facilities and infrastructure. That is our job. That's our bread and butter, <coughs> minus sewer and water. Uh, but we do coordinate the water resource management. Uh, my presentation will include who we are as an organization within Public Works, what our core services are, what our assets are that we service, what accomplishments we've made, and what goals we have. So our organizational structure has five operational divisions. There are the maintenance division, the construction division, the right-of-way maintenance division, the facilities maintenance division, and the landscape and sustainability division. In full staffing, we're at 45. Uh, right now, we're at staffing levels of 42. So we have three positions uh, that are currently vacant. The maintenance division with a staffing level of seven, and staffing level of seven maintains 720 Lane miles of roadway, which is over 87 million square feet of asphalt, 150 miles of storm sewer, and associated easements. 
Uh, the easements are generally 20 feet to 30 feet wide, uh, and the acreage is substantial. Uh, we maintain over 13,000 storm sewer structures that are inlets, outfalls, headfalls, you name it, with the core services being asphalt patching, asphalt crack sealing, storm sewer maintenance, storm sewer repair, and easement maintenance. Our construction division with a staffing level of 10 maintains 160 miles of sidewalk, which is over 3,500,000 square feet of concrete, 700 miles of curb and gutter, and 61 traffic calming devices throughout the city. Those are your uh, roundabouts and your um, speed bumps. They're all in Ashton Park and Lanes. So <laughs> <laughs> At the request of the yeah, right, right. Yeah, but there it is. <laughs> for traffic calming. Yeah. <laughs> Core services include sidewalk repair, sidewalk construction, and retaining wall construction, curb and gutter repair, curb inlet repair, and traffic calming construction. Our right of way division with a staffing level of seven. We maintain 2,600 acres of the city's right of way, the downtown urban core, and that includes both parking deck structures. Now, our core services are street sweeping, bush hogging, and mowing. We do cutbacks and vegetation clearing. Now, this can include everything from just vegetation overhanging into the roadway, obstructing sight line distances at intersections, to vegetation obstructing the pedestrian way. Now, so we do a lot of that throughout the year, particularly right now during the growing season. Uh, we do litter patrol and then downtown maintenance. So we have a, a crew that is dedicated just to the downtown maintenance. Facility maintenance. Facilities maintenance division with a staffing level of four. We maintain 18 separate city facilities and buildings. Those services include janitorial and custodial services, including management of contracts for those services for various uh, facilities, routine building maintenance, routine building repairs, and facility contract management, including that some of those associated with janitorial and custodial services. Our landscape and sustainability division with a staffing of eight. Uh, we maintain all the city's grounds, so the landscape uh, maintenance of our city grounds, minus parks and recreation. We maintain downtown Auburn's landscape, all the islands and medians throughout the city. We maintain those through contractual services agreement. And we maintain certain areas by cooperative maintenance agreement with ALDOT. We have two interchanges currently and expect at least one more to come online in the next few years. Uh, core services include landscape maintenance and installation, landscape architectural services, urban forestry management, mosquito abatement, seasonal decorations, and sustainability guidance. Some of our key accomplishments within urban forestry, we do over 3,500 generally tree inspections per year. Last year we did 3,416 with some interruptions with COVID. Uh, 613 homeowner calls that we responded to in the previous year associated with trees. We planted over 235 trees in the last year and removed 127. We have a pretty aggressive risk management program, so we do risk assessments on all of the city's tree assets. Uh, and we do occasionally have to remove high-risk trees. Uh, so we removed 127 last year, and we've coordinated 485 volunteer hours with various organizations for exotic invasive removal, kudzu, Chinese privet, Neely Agnes. Uh, we've worked well with different organizations to do that. As far as key accomplishments with streets and drainage, we repaired over 90 potholes in last year with 12 miles of crack ceiling, and 75 drainage complaints were resolved through our maintenance. Program. Each one of those <coughs> pothole responses, it may not just be a single pothole. It says 90 in the City Works Service request, but those 90, again, we may have two or three patches that we perform in one single pothole response. Uh, so I did want to highlight that. Uh, similarly, with our sidewalk repair and extension program, we performed over 45 ADA sidewalk concern uh, <coughs> resolutions. So those 45, again, that's multiple patches with each. When we go out and look at an ADA compliance or non-compliance issue, we don't just look at the issue. We will typically walk two or three hundred feet of the sidewalk up and downhill of where the issue is and make all repairs that we find. Um, and we've also done 25,000 linear feet of sidewalk construction associated with these patches in the last year. Uh, as far as our key accomplishments with landscape and sustainability, we have continued the Boykin Veggie Trails program, uh, working with Al Davis and his staff. Uh, to provide uh, sustainable uh, food options at the Boynton Community Center by a community garden. 
And we've expanded the city's roadside wildflower program. You'll see these installations on Glen, you'll see them at the recycling center, and some down along Sand Hill Road near the H.C. Morgan recycling, I mean H.C. Morgan wastewater facility. Uh, key accomplishments with our litter control program. We generally collect more than 8,000 bags of litter in a year. In 2021 alone, we collected 8,500 bags of litter throughout the city with our litter control program. Uh, keep in mind, that was minus the trustees. That's just with the community service uh, volunteers that come through our program. Uh, so right now, we're on par to exceed that at 4,708 bags collected since November 1st. And with facilities maintenance, we've serviced over 350 service requests with our city facility associated with requests from staff, facilitated condition assessment of the Gay Street parking deck, and facilitated the replacement of a tiller at the Auburn Public Library. Uh, as far as key metrics and goals, I'm not going to read from this slide. In short, it's to be responsive to our citizens, to make sure that we are responding to every single citizen service request that we receive and that we're meeting routine service goals within our department for each division. So with that, thank you. Questions from council? I just have a comment. I love the wildflower seed packets. I may have snagged a few. Um, and I think they're fantastic. And I, I just love that little just detail that y'all provide. And um, also thank you for providing, at the last meeting I mentioned food for us. And I have since learned that we have planted blueberries at Fire Station 6, and I think that's fantastic. Will and be. I will be planting them. Um, and I'll happily come and help maintain those. <laughs> um, and that there are fruit trees planted at the library, right? Yes, ma'am. And uh, I didn't realize that pomegranates can grow here, so that's a new thing I've learned. It grows quite well, actually. So that's exciting information. See, those are the kinds of things that people can learn about when we do these things. And I, I find it um, really great that we are already starting that. So thank you for <coughs> providing the information after the last meeting. Appreciate that. So the org chart doesn't reflect all the divisions that you talked about. Is this because of the interrupt your active role? Or are you uh, a maintenance division, a landscape sustainability division? There's, there's only four division level so there's a, there are five divisions it's we have a landscape and sustainability coordinator that coordinates the activities between the two divisions of right of way and landscape and sustainability if the org chart is incorrect it's showing yeah it shows four divisions yeah. with the split below that director right. manager which is he's vacated that position while he's filling it that's why what appears and because of the temporary situation so we have not filled the landscape and sustainability division manager position. Okay. all right thank you <coughs> Dan, thanks for your hard work. Thank you for stepping in front of leadership. We Absolutely. appreciate the way y'all keep our right of ways looking good yeah. for all of our visitors coming to see us. Thanks for your hard work. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. And if Councilman Hovey, that you know, that's the lowering of the I'm just kidding. All in way. That's right. <laughs> we get a few complaints when we pour speed humps to certain Certain heights and a few council members have said they're they're a little lot tall. I'm I'm in a pickup truck and I'm about to scrape. So we have adjusted some of those. Um, and, but the nice thing is because we control our own streets, we can do that. So next we have Mr. Eric Carson with the Water Resource Management Department. Page. Hold on, he's got to advance the slide, and I'll get you to the page. Whoop. To the lower right corner, 108. As a caveat, remember the whole water side of things, and this is the general fund budget. So, huh? what I'm saying though, it's is, yeah, it's sorry, it's in the sewer fund, but you won't see the, the whole water right. board budget because that's a separate entity, same as the industrial board. So, really, it's the sewer fund is what really hits, it's not in the general fund. <coughs> yeah. There we go, make it nice and confusing. Well, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to you today about mm -hmm. the water resource management. It's a department I'm very proud of, and uh, following Dan's will be tough because I don't have all the pretty pictures that he has. There's not a whole lot I can show you from the sewer plan or manholes or something look like that. that. So that's about as close as we're going to get. Anyhow, <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I am. 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 I
you know, a lot of what we do goes unseen, uh, and, and that's a good thing because if something's going on in our system, it's normally a bad thing. So if you don't hear a lot, that means we're typically doing a good job. So um, I want to talk about some of our accomplishments over the last few days, and then some of the key metrics. Uh, I know it's a lot of numbers and engineering stuff that only engineers that I'm Scott would respect. But uh, if you have any questions when I'm done, I'll be, I'll be glad to try to answer them. So. so some key accomplishments over the last two years. On the previous slide, you saw the H.C. Morgan plant. We completed a major project there. We added a clarifier, uh, septic and um, grease handling station, and we expanded our biosolids handling there. That was a big, big thing for us. Um, also, the Highway 14 force main replacement project, that was an 18-inch HDP pipe. You might remember a year and a half ago in January, we had an emergency repair out there where the hydrogen sulfide gases in the pipeline ate up the steel pipe. So we went back with the, uh, the HDP pipe, and, and that should provide us you know, good service for, for as long as we're around. So I'm uh, real happy about that. The project went real well. We're, on the, we're wrapping that up right now. Um, Sanford and Gay sewer improvements project. You may remember last August, uh, we had a major intersection total up at, at Sanford and Gay, uh, right during the time students were trying to move in. We we're under the gun trying to get a new sewer line put in before the um, engineering public works uh, ALDOT project that just kicked off, uh, was, was supposed to start in October, I believe. So we were under the gun to get that done. We used city crews to get that done. It was probably, if we had bid that out, it would have been about a three or four hundred thousand dollar project. We did that in-house with our crews and they did a thank of job. But I appreciate y'all being patient with us going through those growing pains. But unfortunately it's all tore up again now. <laughs> and then um, we did some major rehab work in basin six and sixteen. As part of our sanitary sewer studies the previous year we identified uh, major sections in these two basins that to where we're getting I and I into our system basically sucks capacity out of our system. So we went in and repaired uh, multiple sections in these basins along West Long Lake Drive and West Bedford Parkway, uh, Shooter Parkway down by um, the south side of the campus. Uh, of course, uh, West Magnolia near Auburn University, uh, Batch Avenue, Martin Luther King Drive and Hemlock Drive did some major rehab there. Some key metrics, uh, just some fun facts, I guess. Total miles of sewer in the system right now, we're at 340 miles of sewer. We're averaging, with our current growth rate, averaging about five miles of sewer a year. Uh, manholes, we're at 7,983 city maintained manholes right now. On average, we're adding about 150 a year to the system right now. And, uh, we have 16 lift stations. That includes a couple we just added recently. Uh, unfortunately, as the city continues to grow and jump into other basins or pump stations are planning, we'll be online here soon. Uh, so that'll probably jump up to seven, 18 or 19 lift stations here in the next two years. So, um, we have two permitted treatment facilities. Of course, you know about the north side plant out at the end of Richland Road that's been mothballed and is now just a pump station that pumps everything to the south side through that force main on Highway 14 to replace. And of course, the H.C. Morgan plant down on uh, Sand Hill Road. Some annual statistics. Right now, we're cleaning between 250 and 300 miles of pipe a year. Uh, so you, you can see we have 340 miles total in the system. So we're almost cleaning the entire system every year. That is excellent. Uh, most cities can only maybe get to 20% of their system in a year. They, 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 you know, they can do it and turn it over every five years. They're doing good. Our guys are doing really good. And that shows in our number of uh, overflows in our system. Uh, we're, we're under 10 overflows a year, and that is tremendous for a city our size. There was a time when we were in the 20s and 30s, uh, so they've done a good job, and the cleaning helps uh, keep those overflows down. Total miles to east ones, right away, so we push all and maintain 53 miles. And then um, lateral inspections. This is something we started uh, two years ago as a pilot project internally. And the reason we did that is because we're building homes so fast these days that a lot of times laterals are getting damaged during construction. And that means um, family, families were moving in, 
week or two in, into the house they're having an overflow and we're getting a call because sometime during construction construction the lateral got crushed or pinched and our guys are having to respond at two in the morning to unclog something so you know they can do what they have to do uh, so typically what we do is go out and we'll, we'll tv a lateral before a home starts construction and we'll go out and tv it again when they're done and that way we know who caused what and we can make sure that the homeowner is protected and that our city sewer lines are so uh, that, that's quite a bit. Uh, Grease trap inspections, 272 inspections last year. <coughs> this next number, again, points to the growth in the city. We handle all the line locations for water, sewer, city fiber, all that stuff. 17,848 line locations tickets were called into the city last year. That's Very over quick, the yeah, day. Real quick, a lot of you call me and say, what, what's going on in the neighborhood? And usually the only way we know when somebody's out there marking is if we have water and sewer that we had to mark. So I'm, my first call is to Eric, who then looks up the system to see that that's a lot of line locates. So we have three three line locators. That doesn't mean they went out and, and located every one of those, but they have to sort through every ticket and decide which one applies, which one doesn't apply. If it doesn't apply, make sure whoever does apply gets the message they need to go out there. So. Uh, and then just some, some numbers there, some fun fact numbers. At the H.C. Morgan plant, in 2021, they treated 3.4 billion gallons of wastewater, and that averages out to 9.3 million gallons a day. Key metrics for the watershed department, that's another division we're very proud of. Marla Smith does a great job with them. Uh, She's responsible for the MS4 program that you've probably heard about in the Lake Overtree Watershed Protection Program. In 2021, uh, as far as erosion setup control, they did 1,575 erosion inspections on 117 sites. Um, in that time span, they issued 27 NOVs, notice of violation, and had to issue six work orders, uh, stop work orders for to make sure, just to stop the contractors and get them fixed with their most of the time they're pretty compliant, but sometimes you gotta get a little stronger. Uh, water quality samples out in our tributaries and watersheds, 421. <coughs> Number of illicit discharges investigated, 13. That could be anything. People pouring paint down the storm drain, uh, pouring grease out the back of the restaurant, or concrete being washed out into a storm drain or anything like that. And then public education and outreach. This is an area that uh, they've really excelled in lately. Um, Marla picked up the banner from Dan, Dan left, and, and uh, we participated in the Lee County Water Festival, birthday activities, city downtown trick or treat, the after school program activities, the city park in the park, Camp Kaleidosco, city Easter egg hunt, multiple string cleanups, neighborhood cleanups with the public works department. Uh, so really getting out there, trying to address the young and the old, teach them about watersheds and the environment, sewer and all that. So, really proud of that. so um, with that, um, you know, we have some initiatives moving forward. We're always trying to increase capacity of the sewer system, dry up uh, sewer lines that are getting I and I. Uh, we're, we're trying to get our south side plant re-permitted to 25 million gallons a day. We're actively doing that now. Right now it's permitted to 11. Five. Um, just, uh, trying to stay out of it. So, with that, if you have any questions, you can answer any questions. Just with? Hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my baby. Um, no, I, so I know we're not talking about true like water, um, but can you just touch on here lately um, on the north side of town where we are with um, water? resources and oh, I've had several um, constituents um, complain about the taste of our water. Um, I experienced that on my side of town at, at, in Ashton. So talk about like kind of what the plans are for the future for the north side of town, if you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, taste of odor is one thing. Primarily that, that that taste and odor issue is coming from water that we supplement our system with from Opelika, unfortunately. Y'all probably read in the paper about what's going on at Saugahatchee Lake. They're taking drastic measures to cut back how much they produce from that lake and bring more from their other plant until the situation goes away. They're also, also on the back end looking for a, a treatment technique to take that out to get rid of that problem moving forward. 
Uh, what we do in the meantime is try to restrict flow from them as much as possible and push more from our system um, until we can get through this. So when we have someone that calls and has a complaint like that, what's, what's the... Taste and odor. Taste and odor, yeah. What we'll try to do, uh, typically taste and odor increases with age. We'll try to go out there and flush hydrants in the area, try to freshen up to the extent we can, but we're very limited. Um, and then I know we touched on it Monday, um, Ward Tower, and I know you've spoken to this in the past, but can you give me an update on a potential Ward Tower for the north side of town? I know there's one off of Farmville, but even for the um, growth that we're going to be seeing, I'm out 147 and the west side of Farmville. That's right. That, that's something we've had our, our eye on for a long time. The problem is when you put a storage tank. You're storing a lot of water up in the air, and, and if you don't turn that tank over, it ages, and that can create disinfection byproducts in the water, and it can also uh, make the situation with taste and odor issues worse because the water ages in that tank. You need to be able to turn that tank over every two days, minimum. Uh, uh, so, what we would be looking to do is build a 200 to 250,000 gallon tank up there. What does that mean? That means to build a tank that size, we need at least four or five hundred homes to be served by that tank to be able to turn that tank over in a timely manner. There's some new developments coming in out there off of North College that is, that is you know, if they move forward, would be enough homes to justify a tank up there. So we have started doing, uh, we've identified a site that we talked about. We're going to start doing some geotech work to make sure that site is even feasible. And then we have, yeah, there, there will be some things in our budget the water budget mm -hmm. to start design and build the tank if everything moves that direction it is, it is proposed in the ground budget. Okay. Uh, probably to start with 25 but that, that can move here too. Like so. so we could potentially make that up if we see the increase in homes coming online with that? We know the homes wouldn't be built fast enough to move it up any faster than 2025. Okay. Um, that would be the absolute fastest. Um, and speak real quick about why we supplement our water from Pocahontas. Okay. All the Auburn Water Works Board's resources are on the south side of town. So we have to push all that water to the north side of town. Uh, also, the higher north you go, the higher in elevation you get, so the less pressure we have. But Mobile is 100 feet higher than us, elevation-wise, their tanks, so they can provide more pressure. Um, so we do it for pressure purposes and also for capacity. It helps offset the water we have. Uh, well, like on today's, like today, if we're pushing 12 or 13 million gallons a day, it's hard for us to push that much water north, so we supplement with that to help. So, what do I tell the average um, citizen who doesn't have speak water? Why we um, why we wouldn't put the infrastructure in to? Is it because we don't have? the actual water basins on the north side of town, or is it like water reservoirs on the north side of town? Or is right, it we, we don't have any, the, there's no aquifer on the north side of town, but we can put wells into um, Obelaka has all the water sources on the north side of town, so we have lake and the whole of that. There's just no water sources up there other than Obelaka. So in English also, pumping that water from the south to the north is not help with pressure, you know, and gravity is our number one friend. So the people that live in the vicinity of Interstate 85 have pressure reducers in their house because of gravity. And so we have the opposite problem in the north because it's higher in elevation. So pushing from the Opelika system, which is at a higher elevation, it is keeping pressure, which is important not just for showers, but fire flow. Um, it's a health, safety, welfare issue for us as well. So supplementing from the Opelika system is important. The taste and odor thing, though, we do expect in the long term, um, you know, and not to to get way into the future, but we have plans to address it in the long term that are starting to move in the right direction. We have massive plans to address this with the like of a brand new undertaking of, of many things, and, and probably the next quadrennium in the next four years, you'll hear more about that. Um, we're gearing up, and that's also back to a lot of federal things we're doing. This is massive enough, the effort that we may undertake in partnership with Opelika that we garner a lot of federal funds and is way north of a $100 million project. That's 
a massive project that we may we may undertake. I can't say that we will, but we are headed in that direction. Okay, but most likely not until the next project, yeah, on quarter. That would be yeah, that would just when you start seeing activity with regard to that. And even though yes, it involves our waterworks board, you'll be kept very well informed as a council okay. of what we may be doing in that realm. Thank you. On the north side the treatment facility or pumping station, uh, we talked some years ago about the need to reactivate or replace that sewage treatment facility for all the growth on the north side of town. Where do we stand on projections for that? Well, based on the current projections, I'm not sure we're going to have to do that anytime soon. Uh, with the replacement of the force main on Highway 14, uh, the capacity of the existing pump station and the modeling we're doing now, I think for the foreseeable future, we're going to be able to continue to operate the way we have been. Um, there are some other things in, in the capital improvement plan, uh, some improvements maybe an equalization tank that would add additional capacity to that pump station that would see that the, that system last for another 20, 30 years without the effort. Possibly. So take into account the old Sanford uh, development? Yes. And are they going to have a water tank no. up there? No. All right. Thank you. And that also ties into us trying to get that south side sewer treatment plant repurposed. <coughs> we first were sworn in there was that really sensitive project where we expanded the line through Shawaka State Park and um, there was a lot of cooperation and conversation um, can you just kind of speak to how that project ended up going and yes that, that project ended up being great yeah. and uh, you know, the, the days like today when we're hitting 12 13 million gallons a day and, and our neighbor unfortunately is having to take some odor issues we can offset a great deal of that water we would buy from them with that high quality groundwater it's the most economical water we have. It's the highest quality water we have. And that, that, that project was a tremendous success. And many of the people who came and spoke about that project, the council of them come and told me that they really appreciated what we did. And, and some of them that were against us told us that you know they were wrong. And I even got written letters uh, of appreciation for that. So it, it's been a success all the way around. And I can say that it was very well received after the fact. We really appreciate the state park system working with us. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. Thank you for everything y'all do. Thank you for working all the time and night when you have to and helping us continue to move forward in the future. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Before we're, we're finished with the public services business unit, we're going to roll into development services. Do you guys need a quick five minutes? Five minutes. We'll start five the minutes. development round. Five minutes. Well, that would be seven minutes. We're starting at 4 30 sharp. <laughs> or else. <laughs> I, let, I did. I, I'm looking at my schedule wrong without my glasses on. We do have Becky. Let's get Parks and Recreation done and then we'll take a break. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That's my fault. We're going to make it without some coffee for Becky's fast. You know, like he's okay. We're going to make it. Okay. <laughs> if it, if it, okay. I'd like to take just a few minutes to talk to you about some uh, projects that we completed in the last two years in Parks and Recreation and also some statistics to give you a little bit of an overview with um, what's going on as far as usage of facilities. So key accomplishments, um, we of course have opened the Town Creek Park inclusive playground which was much anticipated and has been uh, full pretty much every day, and even some of the days when it's been really hot, so it's been uh, very rewarding. Denius Park, which was 13 acres with a three-quarter mile walking trail, two dog parks, pavilion, playground, restroom, and, which is basically in the middle of town and uh, is used uh, heavily. We also have added a, uh, the remainder of the parking lot because of the heavy use. Sam Harris Park Greenway, which runs from Sam Harris Park over to the Humane Society and back, and also connects to the Shudger soccer fields. We also added a pavilion parking and additional playground equipment at Sam Harris. We. Um, 
have added an e-sports room at Frank Brown Rec Center, which um, is fairly popular on a day like today when it's too hot to do anything else. And so we've had uh, a lot of parents coming in with their kids to, uh, to use that. And we converted two of the tennis courts at Sanford Avenue Tennis to six pickleball courts. And that is another amenity that's used quite a bit. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, hey, Sam Harris Paul, and I think I talked to Megan about it. Oh, we was talking about the swings. Can you, can you uh, tell me a little bit about the swings? Mm -hmm. We Thanks. have swings. The uh, company that um, did the playground equipment at the new, play, new inclusive playground had some ex an extra swing set. We had to order the seats and everything to go with it, and so as soon as those come, we'll get it installed. Okay, you think that'll happen probably this summer? Or? Oh, I certainly hope so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, we, um, with a donor, renovated McTeer Park, which is the small park that is along Chihuahua Drive. And uh, we removed some um, invasive plants, added uh, some a swing, some benches, and landscaping. And uh, that's really reinvigorated that park. We did some columbariums at Memorial Park Cemetery. A cremation garden on the old water tower site at Pine Hill Cemetery. We initiated a Parks and Recreation social media. We have Instagram and uh, Facebook, which has been very successful. And we implemented, or in the process of implementing, the MyRec online uh, system for registration and reservations. The registration system is, is active. The reservation system will become active sometime this summer, and we're really excited about that. And I want to thank uh, Greg and uh, his folks and Allison and her folks for their work on um, assisting us with that. Thank you. That's reservations for facilities as well as fields. And Correct. Parks. It'll be for parks, parks and fields and whatever somebody wants, oh, rooms in a yes. facility, whatever. Okay, some metrics um, that I thought you might be interested in. In youth athletics, uh, in the last year, we've had 6,136 participants. Our numbers are close to being back to what they were before COVID. There's been a little bit of a change in what ages we're heaviest in. Uh, the upper level of basketball was down a little bit last year. Probably, according to one of my Parks and Rec Advisory Board members, because their game started at 9.30 at night. And so that's one of the challenges. Becky, why 9.30 at night? Because we don't have any other time for them to play. <laughs> we don't have the facility Correct. space for them to play in earlier. So um, the other uh, athletics uh, that we allow to use our facilities when we can. We have Auburn Thunder, they use as a soccer complex. We have lacrosse, which is at several different places around uh, town. Mountain biking, we have an adult soccer program that plays three uh, seasons a year. Hispanic soccer, we have various travel teams and training groups in sports that uh, use our facilities. We have a large adult volleyball program, and we have various home schools, private schools that use our facilities. Auburn City Schools uses some of our facilities. The Raptors travel basketball, and we actually have a proposal on the table right now on someone that is wanting an adult flag football program. And so right now we're going to wait a little bit on that before we decide if we have room. Uh, tournaments for team sports, this um, in the past year we had 981 teams. Uh, in FY19 we had 348 teams. I think that's uh, probably indicative of the continuing growth and popularity of um, travel tournaments. And uh, this past year we had two big um, soccer travel tournaments with well over 100 teams to add to all the baseball and softball that we do. Tennis events, we had uh, 4,585 participants 
in FY19, we had 2,604. And our tennis programs have continued to grow. Um, Brett Peterson has done a great job working with the USTA and those groups and bringing in uh, some of their bigger tournaments. And we're to the point now where they call us and ask us to do them instead of us having to call them. The um, last group of metrics is more about uh, other facilities. Facility contact usage, uh, we had 185,912 come in and make contact in one of our facilities. I couldn't give you a um, comparison to 19 because Boykin was still in some of our numbers during that time, but that's basically anybody that comes into one of our facilities for anything, whether it's to watch their child play, to work out, to take a program, to do whatever. Program enrollment, which is um, classes, not athletics, is 5,848. Swimming, 8,628. Again, in FY19, Drake Pool was still included, and so we didn't do a comparison there. Cultural arts programs, 2,737. Special events in cultural arts, 24,185. <coughs> art camps and arts education, 830. In arts education, uh, we do a lot, do two different programs for the schools. You may have seen on social media mm -hmm. all the th information about the uh, Sloss Furnace people coming, which was really an exciting program, but that was for the um, the elementary schools. Uh, event attendance, these are the events other than those arts geared special events, 19,654. That includes everything from the Easter egg hunt, daddy daughter date night, uh, downtown trick or treat. The market is included in that. We're anywhere from 300 and up every week at the market, 500 some weeks, so it uh, really has taken off. We um, also include our concerts at Kiesel and other events. Our park reservation attendance, 17,966, compared to 11,351 in uh, FY19. And, um, one of the things we saw during COVID was a huge increase in the number of people using our parks because they felt it was safe, it was a good place for them to go. We um, have in the past at times run a trash route and a cleanup route during the, uh, the, a weekend. We run every day, seven days a week, to our parks to empty trash and do cleanup. So it's, um, it's really quite a um, quite a change. So cemeteries, one interesting thing, you probably were wondering why we were building so many columbariums. It used to uh, be that we had a vast majority of our burials were ground burials. As you can see, 94 ground burials, 48 cremations, so a third that we did are uh, cremations and the trend is, is trending up. It's continuing to rise. So we anticipate cremation to become one of, um, one of the um, predominant ways of having burials. So that's the numbers and everything that I um, have for you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, okay, I, I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I, I appreciate the cemetery, or uh, Whiskey Cemetery, having those park benches in them, uh, those benches in them now. Um, and, and I think that the community there uh, appreciate that also. Back when I was on the cemetery board uh, before I got on city council, that I served on for nine years. That's my background. Um, I had asked for those benches to be put in, so they're now in there. So I am grateful for that. You're welcome. Uh, just personal clarification on the tournament number of tournaments. Nine hundred eighty-one teams. Is that the teams. Okay. 
Yeah. Because that could be baseball, basketball. Yeah, yeah. baseball, basketball, softball, men's slow, slow pitch softball, soccer. Gotcha. Yeah. In my reg, do we have that, that software in hand already? Is that something we've already paid for? It's just the implementation that we're working on? Yes, it's, uh, we actually, with my rent, you pay once once a year, and we have it in our budget to pay um, by the year, and uh, we're working on finishing them. So the, the, in, them. yeah, in the rollout, what happened was we need to do um, registration first. <coughs> we talked and we wanted to get kinks out of anything having to do with the facility side. Um, that is, right now, you fill out a form. It has to go in, it has to go through a bunch of people. You have to do it in person or email it in. It's difficult. This is 100%. You have the ability to do it online or in person. And that'll be for any, any citizen, not necessarily a city league participant. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to reserve a... Do you want to there'll be a, there'll be a yeah. calendar, so if you wanted to do a field somewhere, you could pull up that facility and see what fields are available at the time interested in and perhaps or city city leagues or city teams would have priority on that or is it just going to be a, a free-for-all for in practice space my thoughts would be that once we know what times that we will be using it for our city teams that those times would be blocked out yeah. It is also one of the things in implementing this I've heard from a lot of council members who heard from a lot of citizens was given the ability for the club teams to know exactly when facilities were available and, and we could push times and, and also make it clear whose field it is. You can see that somebody's got a reserve right before you and right after you and it's yeah. time to change over. So in looking, we modeled a lot of very high growth cities also and what they were doing to maximize time. I mean, one of my goals has been to maximize play. As you saw in some of our capital projects on our assets, we do have changing turf products, improving things, doing online scheduling so that we can maximize absolute play and people don't feel like they're having a call to figure out, well, when can I schedule, they can see. Becky, do you measure wait lists on numbers for different programs and sports? We have a very long waiting list for day camp. Okay. If, a, if a child is signed up by the deadline in athletics, they're placed on a team which may be kind of hurting us because some of the, it creates so many teams and uh, certain leagues, but if, they're, if they sign up on time, they're put on a team. But we are getting to the point where that's gonna be even more difficult. In basketball, you really, to give them a chance to play very much, you can only put 10 on a team, and so you're kind of limited what you can do. So with the um, additional fields and gymnasium spaces in our proposed budget, do you think we can um, fulfill some of those needs? That yes. Okay. Actually, when the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board was evaluating it, they were looking, they are very aware of what our needs are and because they hear from the public as well and they were trying to fill as many needs with the facilities as they could. For instance, the multi-use fields, they'll be able to meet the needs of all those groups that would be multi would be field space, but they also could be used for practice for baseball with movable backstops. It would enable those kids that, to be able to do that. Becky, y'all oversee much of the therapeutics program, programming that goes on, and um, we had a great send off for our Special Olympics athletes recently. Um, can you kind of talk about the growth of the therapeutics population in our community? Obviously, we just opened this brand new park, and what a community, the community center means for the therapeutics programs and things. Well, you know, our, um, our idea is to make Dean Rec Center a therapeutic center and um, one of the um, of course everyone knows that the city schools have a great um, special education program and a lot of people move here for those programs so then they want to participate in our programs and um, there has been continued growth in it and um, 
this summer we're doing some um, some camps at some of our outdoor facilities for younger children which are all full I don't think there's a waiting list at this time Beth I think they just filled it up but, um, and then we're doing our regular camp and at, um, at Drake but the numbers will continue to rise there's no doubt about that and we feel like that the numbers that have gone up uh, as far as the ones you're looking at is growth it's not necessarily somebody who's lived here for a long time that suddenly decided they wanted to play it's people moving here wanting to play last friday night i went out to the ceremonies of the travel baseball tournament that the braves were involved with and other than all the little roll tide boys booing me um <laughs> it was um it seemed to be going great and i just appreciate you and your staff you had a lot of staff out there and they were um, overseeing helping oversee the tournament and uh, at least on Friday night everybody was smiling and having a great time so I appreciate that thank you any other questions for Becky this time really great five minutes all right hey y'all we're ready to get started so we're gonna jump back into it. we have about an hour more presentations to go um, so we're going to finish up with our development services departments and then police and fire. So we have right now Mr. Al Davis with community services. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to say just uh, a few words about what we do in community services. People ask me all the time, what do we do? So this kind of will give you a snapshot of the things that we have. Uh, we create opportunities for families to realize the dream of home ownership. That's one of the things we enjoy the most. We invest uh, by rehabbing existing homes for homeowners. We work with our partners the, uh, the, that to help us do that. PCM, Presbyterian Community Ministries, and our own rural ministry works a lot with us for that. And we have other partners that, even though they don't receive CDBG dollars, also help us. The Dream House in the community we are often able to refer individuals to. We serve those in need of essential services, uh, particularly child care, uh, youth programming. We work with uh, Beck and Park and Rex with uh, uh, sports families <coughs> to make sure that those uh, young people, low mod, are able to participate in the various sporting programs. Uh, we, we, we work with people to keep them out of a situation where they may be at risk of homelessness. So, that's one of the things we do with our CDBG dollars. So we leverage uh, and we work with economic development uh, with our Section 108 loan program uh, to uh, support job creation. It's been a very successful program. And Philip uh, does a good job with his staff, and we work with him on that. And probably one of the joys that we have, because we're located at Borkin, we have the pleasure of managing the Borkin Community Center uh, complex. Uh, some of our key accomplishments over the last year, we partnered with the North Auburn Housing Development Corporation to provide affordable housing for three families. There is one house that has been completed. Uh, we are now working on the second house on Tucker. It will be ready for occupancy uh, the end of this month. Uh, a wonderful young uh, man and his two children are looking forward to occupy that house. The, uh, house next to his, and we actually got two houses next to that one on Tucker. We finish out the houses on Tucker. Uh, those two houses are also have already already have owners ready to go. They have uh, they're qualified. Their bankers have approved their loans, and uh, the next house next to the young man and his two children is another young single father with one child. And then the last house is a, a single mom with two children. So these houses are certainly ideal for, for those families. Uh, we launched a new resource center at Working Community Center. We are very pleased with that. It gives individuals in the community that don't have access to technology, maybe at home, don't have a computer, they can come to the resource center and take advantage of it to fill out applications for jobs and so forth. Uh, we, we've been very happy to work with the library on the uh, APL at Working. It has given uh, a lot of individuals, particularly Northwest Auburn, an opportunity to access library services and still stay in the community. The senior center is located right next to uh, APL uh, at Working, so the seniors take advantage of it. Uh, our daycare centers, uh, they also have an opportunity to take advantage of it, and so it's been a really good partnership for us. 
And we partnered with Albert Housing Authority, a nonprofit corporation, <laughs> the Albert Community Development Corporation, to launch the Borkin Community Center Food Pantry. I'm we'll going to talk about it a little later, but it has been a tremendous uh, <coughs> activity at Borkin, and we're very proud to have it there. Uh, and of course, we do what we do every year. We, we, we manage the city CBG program. So the CBG annual action plan, and the, we had a big role with the coronavirus funding, and that was a big part of what we've done the last year and a half. And so we manage all those dollars, which was about $1.5 million of the money that came down to us as a grantee, uh, as a HUD grantee, as well as some dollars we got from the state. I got a question for you go further. Yes. And it may come up later, but what is the hours of that uh, library? What, what are the hours? Uh, they are actually open the same time the building is open. Okay. So when working is open, it is open. Oh, okay. Uh, some key metrics. Uh, we've been able to help some 814 seniors who receive services through our CBG funding programs for seniors. Uh, we are always delighted when we can help seniors and and so we've been able to, to channel a lot of CBG dollars to support our seniors. Uh, over 496 youths have participated in education, recreational, and cultural programs that have been funded by CDBG. Uh, we, we support our daycare centers at Borking, as well as the Boys and Girls Club, who has received considerable dollars from us, all of those entities, not only from funding from us, but funding that we were able to provide for them through the COVID dollars. So a lot of money has flowed to, a lot, to those organizations. Five houses we rehabilitated, use the CBG funding, work with our partners. Uh, this is probably a number that's somewhat staggering. Uh, we only have six full-time employees, including a, a facility aid worker, and we provided uh, support to some 6,757 individuals and families over, since over the last year and a half, providing them dollars to support them through the coronavirus pandemic. Most of these people we had to deal with in person, uh, but we do what we have to do. We took precautions and still met with all these citizens and made sure they got the services they needed to get through that pandemic. And that has been a significant uh, undertaking for our staff. And we're, we're, I'm so appreciative of all of them. We're just sticking in there and being able to help all the people that we needed to serve. Over 1,000 individual families received homeless prevention services through our normal CDBG program. That's like rental, utility, mortgage assistance, Homeless vouchers. We have a lot of people uh, to make sure they don't fall into a situation where they could potentially be homeless. Uh, a lot of you don't know this, but in, in a typical day, we all will have some 740 individuals come through board. It is a busy place. In addition to all the daycares and the Boys and Girls Club and the seniors and now the food pantry and and the resource room and the all University Clinic, there's a lot of movement through that center every day. And so it gives us an opportunity to provide service and make sure people know of the various services that are available not only in our department but throughout the city. The food pantry is probably one of the most active food pantries in the city. It is very busy, it's open two days a week, uh, and it gets a lot of attention. Some 589 individual families have been serviced since April of 2020. Uh, you can see the tonnage, the pounds, 27,900 pounds of food that's been distributed. We are very delighted to have this pantry at Borkin. It has really been able to service a lot of folks. Uh, our Borkin Community Center Veggie Trail, uh, we work with uh, Dan and Public Works with that. It is a, a, a wonderful addition to the site. All of our tenants, uh, the daycares, the senior program, Boys and Girls Club all have raised uh, vegetable beds in that in, in that trail. We've been able to produce some 627 pounds of vegetables. The the daycares use it. Not only do they give it to their their staff, but the, their parents of the children. They use some of the food actually in their feeding programs on site. Uh, they got tomatoes and cucumbers. They just incorporate that as part of their feeding program. But it's been a wonderful program for the children. They're able to plant the, the vegetables. They're able to help harvest the vegetables. They see how things grow. It's been wonderful. I also want to thank Dan. We have lots of fruit trees on our site. <laughs> we plant so lots of trees. Here is here. Yeah, this one. We plant, we've got lots of fruit trees, everything from plums to figs to uh, 
Blueberry bushes. Find her over for a tour. We're going to do that. Yeah. She Blackberry has to be well with all that information. She's got a lot of fruit trees and the children, that, of course, enjoy seeing all those things grow as well. But we have a lot of contacts. We make a lot of contacts with individuals on, by phone, in person. We're just delighted to do what we do. And you got to love people if, you, if you're in our business. And our staff love people. They're very engaging. They go out of their way to make sure people are taken care of, they get the service they deserve, and that's what we do and that's what we enjoy. Uh, any questions I can ask? Well, I, I thank you for all the things that y'all do for the community uh, on this side of town. I really do. And um, I like it, you know, the fact that your community services, they're, you know, they, they respond real good and very helpful. And they make sure that all the needs and everything is uh, is there, and they help out. And, you know, I don't have any complaints. I mean, I, everybody have complaints about something, but I, so far I don't have any complaints about you know the uh, staff and the community service that y'all uh, give to the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize um, what's going on in the medical clinic there? That was a uh, Significant effort, a lot of planning, uh, to build out, and uh, is it working okay? It's slow, uh, but they, I've, I've been talking to them, and they plan on gearing up this fall. Uh, they've kind of gotten through this whole pandemic, right? Uh, and so, as the students come back this fall, they are expected to be in full service mode. Yeah, the, the pandemic and their protocols for the university and other things going yeah. on, so uh, they've not been able to ramp up the way that they wanted to, and so that's changing now. Um, the final tranche of money through the ARPA uh, funds that the city received, the city managers recommended that the city council, um, you know, assign those to the homeless, um, look at homelessness as one of the big uh, ways that we could um, make some contributions to some organizations. You're on the front lines with some of that. Can you just kind of speak to where you see homelessness in Auburn right now? Well, homelessness is kind of a unique thing in Auburn. It is, it's typically, typically when we have homelessness, it's not because, uh, you know, there's people that just generally have nowhere to go. Homelessness in our community is typically driven by someone getting addicted out of the house. Uh, there are typical homelessness situations where people will ultimately end up with a family member or end up being able to get, get on their feet again. So most of the time they're looking for temporary assistance. So we provide, um, you know, some vouchers to get them a couple of days until they're able to make contact with family. Sometimes we have to do a little longer, maybe a week. But that's the typical type of homeless this weekend. It's more temporary in nature, and we're able to help those folks and they get back on their feet or get to a family member. And so, so we don't help them find housing, food. Right. Kind of we'll refer them to other agencies. We have good relationships with all of our partners that we can provide. Uh, homelessness assistance for a couple of days. There's other agencies that can come behind us and provide it also. And so we work together. Uh, and so if we have a family come in, we can help three days. We may call another agency <coughs> there, even help them a couple of days. We work with churches. All of us are linked together. Thank you. And with the medical center, I'm glad you brought that up. With the medical center part of it, uh, are there a lot of people using that medical center in the area? Uh, in the neighborhoods and the community around <coughs> because I, I from my understanding a lot of people don't even know it's open. It's, it's as I said a few minutes ago they're just trying to ramp up uh, and and they do have some days they helped a lot when during COVID they would come in and help with shots and they would do other type of things to help the community but they're really kind of focusing on this fall really ramping up they just had to get through COVID. And they have the same hours as work. Well, no, it may be different this morning. So we don't know what their hours are going to be yet. But we are talking to them, and we have been in discussion with them during this whole time here. So we expect to see a, a significant ramp up in the fall. And they'll get that information out to the community. We will, of course, make it available to them. What medical services do you anticipate they're providing? What we'll, in our, my conversations with them, they're definitely going to provide uh, services, educational, a lot of the educational services. Uh, there's certain be able to help, and they've been talking with the daycares about this, being able to provide assistance when kids get colds, those type of things. And with many of the kids that we have on site that have small illnesses like that, having a clinic there where parents won't have to get up and go across town or go to emergency care 
if they're able to access the clinic to get those type of assistance, I think it's going to be a big boost to the daycare centers and those parents. Yeah, the clinic is independent of us. They have a lease, right. and they want they operate, you know, through the university with a multitude of colleges and schools that will be involved. But the initial concept is everything from nutrition programming to what have you. Um, this is also a lot of clinical things, and it will ramp up over time. The problem with COVID for them is we experienced in our own vaccine clinic the nursing and pharmacy students were giving vaccine doses all over the region um, and so it wasn't a time and they did come into the center at times and, and do vaccines they do blood pressure they do a lot of things that they hadn't been able to with personnel split up doing other things ramp up the clinic the way they wanted to that was I think their programming we will say much more and provide much more and probably have you through there when they fully ramp up this fall and what they had expected to do um, and then COVID happened. What they expected to do in the fall of 20, they'll be doing in the fall of 22. It's just delayed a little bit in their services based on COVID took over and their protocols changed. Delay of pharmacy services. Yes. Yes. So we have security yes. for that. Yes. It's well secured. We don't have access to the pharmacy room and it's in our building. Yeah. But it's going to be a wonderful facility once it gears up because it's, it looks like an urgent care facility when you walk into it now. And you don't access it from inside of Boykin, you access it from the outside. So you say education program, what do you mean by that? Well, the, for example, I'll give you one example. They work with the senior program. They do everything from uh, diabetes, diabetes education, you know, how to deal with that. They're working with the seniors now. They'll do programs with the seniors. Uh, they'll do blood pressure checks. They'll, they'll, they'll help them monitor their health. And so we expect to see more of that for the community. Al, I present you like the idea of putting an air conditioner in the gym and board. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we can make the gym a lot more functional. I, yeah. Doing the summer is almost impossible. Yeah. Much yeah. There. I don't know how the boys and girls close by. During the summer, they use the gym a lot. But yeah, it, it would make a big difference. But one of the nights, the gym could have actually borrowed some air from the from that auditorium. <laughs> 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 it was freezing. <laughs> we turned it down. It was freezing. It was freezing. Thank you, Al, for all your hard work. Y'all got you. your hands on a lot of things. You're impacting a lot of lives. We appreciate it. We that. appreciate you. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. All right, next we have Mr. John Horn with Inspection Services. Page 58. Okay. Travis, I appreciate the time you are giving us to discuss inspection services and what we do to see the citizens. You know, typically inspection services across the country is regulatory and enforcement. Um, we try to do that in a way of working with people. Not trying to force services would provide openly health public life, health and safety, neighborhood preservation due to keeping yards and houses in presentable conditions. The um, we we basically operate on building and life safety codes. And these codes they provide you know are integral to public health. Uh, high standards of buildings for residential or commercial use so people that are visiting them or living in them or own them as a business know that they're safe, uh, that the people that are coming to see them are safe. Citizens are safe, our temporary citizens and students are safe, or our visitors that come for Harvard University events are safe as well. Uh, the one thing that's really kind of nice about the building codes is they, they may be developed at local state federal levels but the city gets to adopt them or uh, bend them to fit some of our more specific needs or it may be written something up northeast that we don't have any issues with um, we don't have issues with frost lines. Uh, now the humid levels humidity levels we do have issues with so as i said we want to work with people uh, so you know, there's a common theme between these points here and it's working with the people that we're serving. Uh, we try to use technology, uh, get feedback from 
maybe do a citizen survey or uh, emails are sent to us or conversations that we have with people to adjust our programs and how we operate them to meet today's needs. Construction from 30 years ago is nothing like construction now. Uh, just in the last three, four years, our office used to be filled with hundreds of rolls of plants. If you find one, it's probably a doorstop now. Um, we've gone so digital, which improves it for everybody. Uh, communication with our customers, uh, which also leads to the next one is providing education. And it's not just sitting down in a classroom, but meeting somebody on site to help them understand why we may need something or to give them advice on how to fix it because we may have seen it on another job. Uh, it's, it really is, is integrating and being there for the builders, the developers, the homeowners, and the citizens. And the last one is working with them for our neighborhoods, keeping them clean of junk and debris, houses that are dilapidated, and even doing that in a way that you know, the law may say you got to do it X number of days or we got to give that much notification. Our inspectors will work with the people to find out what their situation is. Uh, instead of just, you know, husband may have died, lawnmower is not working. We try to work with them. Uh, but ultimately get it cleaned up uh, to keep the overall neighborhoods uh, looking good. So last year, fiscal year 2021, we issued a total of 4,500 permits. Uh, broken down between the, the building, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical. And there's some other random ones in there, but those are the big four. Those permits equal 23,755 inspections last year. That was done by seven inspectors. So we were pretty efficient. Um, I've talked with other cities around the state, and I'm always proud because they'll do less inspections and have 15 inspectors kind of wonder what they're doing all day. Um, ours keep busy. Uh, they, they are doing their inspections, but they're also meeting contractors, working through problems, and helping them whatever they can. The, uh, our averages for commercial versus residential has been staying the same for the last three or four years. Uh, so we're seeing a, a, a constant um, there. Last year, our permits valued $416 million uh, we took in on permits in fiscal 2021. The, uh, we issued in fiscal year 2020 625 single family homes. Last year we issued 775 single family homes. Uh, we're trying to get Eric to get a water tank by getting that. <laughs> so we're doing everything we can. Uh, that's a 24% increase. The, Right now, we're not going to see it probably at that level next year. Um, so we're, we're keeping an eye on that. It'll probably drop back down as finance showed in some of their graphics. John, though, would you say, and the city engineer may weigh in on this, um, some of that there's big talk among council members too about lot availability. Some of that we're bringing them on with subdivisions, but uh, the amount of contractors building infrastructure in the supply chain may be slowing down de facto their ability to deliver lots, which is then slowing this down. It's not lack of availability from a subdivision standpoint. It's probably supply chain and installation of infrastructure that slows that. Oh, yeah, that and it's, it's not a lack of desire. I mean, I believe I saw a statistics from March that an average new home in Auburn is on the park only for 44 days. So yeah, they build it, they sell it. It's uh, Auburn, it's supply chain, it probably as big as their lots as well, it's creating the a little bit of slow down. Interest rates went up a little bit. So it's, um, it's busy. 24% uh, increase is pretty good. Uh, and the other big aspect we have in our department is our neighborhood involvement in the neighborhoods. Uh, here, the uh, concerns that we received in fiscal 21, the, the, the bigger the categories, uh, see how. Uh, kind of breaks down and over here our completion status for last year is we resolved 99% of them so 
the one percent we didn't resolve is something we may have started in September. Uh, it just carried over into October or November or something. So we have two neighborhood inspectors that stay extremely busy uh, working uh, on complaints that we receive through the fix it app, phone calls, emails, people dropping by and telling us, and the, the being proactive. When they see things that need to be addressed, they'll get them addressed. Uh, people take uh, pride in their yard and their property, so we want to help maintain that as well. Uh, but I think Dan mentioned it as, you know, being there, being responsive to the citizens, and even though we're regulatory, we, we still feel we have a chance to have a personal touch and still be responsive. I don't know if <laughs> they got any letters. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Okay. any questions? Or? Any questions for John? Inspection Services? Thank you. It's an unbelievable amount of work. <clears throat> Appreciate you and your staff. There you go. All right, next we have <laughs> Planning Services and Mr. Steve Foote. I have to say that I'm really impressed with all the work that everyone does. This is my first budget with the city of Auburn, so I'm learning a lot by watching everybody, and it's, it's been impressive. Uh, zoning, no one ever wants to talk about it. Uh, it's pretty boring, so I apologize. Your page 56, his budget's not real exciting, but it's there. So uh, we wanted to go over just, or I want to go over some of the accomplishments and other things that we've had going on the last year. And a lot of these are going to be familiar with, but just uh, sort of document them, if you will. So, of course, one of the biggest things we did in the past year was the, the census numbers came in, and we worked with census numbers, and IT, and other departments, city managers' office, and everyone to really put together uh, for the review of the uh, redistricting plan that we went through a few months ago. Of course, uh, when I got here last July, coming up on a milestone next month, I'll be here for one year, which dwarfs in comparison to I know everybody else in the room. So it's like, I'm going to be in the room. But uh, Highway 280 was going on at that time, and we went through that focus area study, did a lot of uh, uh, meetings and discussions about the land uses and so forth, and then we ended up with you know, changes to the future land use map uh, around that area there. And then uh, also, you know, this, this took place before I got here, but revisions to the downtown development and design standards. And so uh, staff worked with the DDRC um, Downtown Development Review Committee to go through table, it's 5.3 uh, or 5-3 in the zoning ordinance, and, and that includes a lot of different things that come into play in the urban core. When you look at buildings and uh, the design and so forth, and they looked at things like fenestration, uh, story height of the ground floor, and uh, facade undulation, that things that just make development look better and sometimes make it function better as well. So, and then, of course, short-term rentals was also an ordinance that was put together and passed last year. Uh, some of the current projects that we are working on, uh, we've had discussions about murals, you know, the current status of murals being prohibited, whether or not to allow them in the future, and so uh, we've been working with Scott and others to parse uh, rec, making some proposed changes, and we'll be bringing those to you in the future for your consideration, and then we'll go through the normal process if that's something that we go forward with. The uh, Planning Commission annual report uh, should be done this week, and so that's something that's done every year. It includes a lot of statistics about you know, what the department has done with the Planning Commission, things that they've reviewed, those types of statistical information. Uh, also, uh, sign code review, I put that on there that back in 2015, there was a uh, now famous Supreme Court case on signage, and it happens to be uh, Reed versus Gilbert, and I did work in Gilbert once, but I had nothing to do with the lawsuit. But uh, it had to do with uh, content neutral requirements for signs where you don't have to look at them to figure out kind of what the regulations that you can apply to them are. And so uh, this is just a review that uh, we'll be working on and bringing forward as well in the future to where we make sure that our sign code is consistent with that purpose. And then let's see, uh, the AIGM, uh, this is something that Logan, uh, bless his heart, spends a lot of time on. And, and this is the Auburn uh, Integrated Interactive, excuse me, growth model, and Auburn started using this back in 2006, I believe, and it's been updated a few times. This year, he's had to spend a lot of time on it because of the census and the traffic analysis zones have changed, and so he's been doing a lot of uh, work on that. 
and updated. It's used in a lot of ways for putting together the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's used for population projections and then trying to forecast the demand for different types of land uses around the community to support that residential. And so um, it's used quite frequently. Uh, it was just a graph that he had handy and it shows sort of some of the prior census uh, numbers along the blue dotted line on the bottom and then the diagonal lines represent different time periods where the uh, model was run. Uh, they all sort of track in the right direction, the same direction, but then you can see that the 2020 census number is actually higher than, a little bit higher than the forecasted uh, numbers from the model. So we'll see how that works out in the future as we get additional years. Some things that are upcoming, we have, um, you know, worked with a lot of different zoning ordinances and I've never found a perfect zoning ordinance. There's always things that <coughs> need to be improved or you find inconsistencies between maybe a section over here and a section over there. So I think it's, it's something in my experience that where you just always go through it and you just kind of always keep an eye out for things that aren't quite right, maybe can be improved on, maybe makes the process of going through some of our, you know, uh, rezoning development review um, processes simpler or, or maybe more understandable. So, so we'll be going through the zoning ordinance and uh, taking a sort of an in-depth look at the different parts of the code, trying to you know, come up with areas that need to be uh, maybe tweaked. So we'll look at that. Of course, we've talked about the five-year update for the Comp Plan 2030, and I believe we're on schedule now to start that next year. We talked about every five years and didn't end in the last one until 2018, I believe. So starting next year, we'll put us on track with that. So we'll be working on that. And then uh, we've just been working with, uh, it says upcoming, but we've actually been working with the IT department and some other uh, departments to come up with a new a GIS platform. We've got all sorts of GIS uh, maps and things of that nature on the web page. But to put everything together that development services and other development related entities use, in the GIS system where you don't have to go out and open a different map and you can see it all right there with the different layers. So we've been working on that and I appreciate all the work that IT is uh, doing to help put that together. So looking forward to that getting done. That's just really repetitive information on what we just talked about or I talked about on the Comp Plan 2030. And you know, all that other stuff is sort of the, the nice fluffy things that we sometimes get to do. And if you know what we do in planning zoning, so we spend all our bread and butter for the most part processing applications that come in every month. And so you know, this is just sort of a reflection of the activity level that, that comes in. You know, administrative plats, they, they don't go to the planning commission, they just go to staff. But uh, 87 of them throughout the year. Um, preliminary plats, of course, final plats, uh, the number of lots are listed there. And then we you know, also process uh, a lot of rezoning requests. Uh, that could be PEDs as well, like the old Stanford request. Uh, conditional uses. Our, our code requires a conditional use for a lot of things. Everything industrial goes through the conditional use process and other ones that go through the entire process. Of course, that process involves going to the Planning Commission, then going forward to the City Council for ultimate consideration. Annexations, 18 annexations for 629 acres. And then we do a lot of zoning certificates. Uh, we've had 18 waivers, uh, different regulations within the zoning ordinance, so something else that we do. And then sign permits. 92 of those. When I was putting this together, it was um, I was kind of thinking, well, what else might you like to know? And I actually asked if there was a way to figure out how many phone calls we get, because I wasn't sure. And uh, so I didn't put it on the slide for you. But it was over 3,000 just since January. And I thought, wow, I would never have thought that we get 3,000 plus phone calls. But um, anyway, so that's a lot of work. We, we, like other departments, it seems like we've been kind of lean. And, um, but uh, we enjoy what we do, I'll say that. You know, um, it's not a glorious, glamorous thing, but I think what the fun thing is about planning and zoning, in my experience, is that we try to make development better. We try to improve the quality of life of development well, for the community and the quality of development whenever we can. We've got a lot of good, talented employees. And we just appreciate the ability to serve you and the city of Auburn. Thank you. Any questions? I appreciate those heavy lifting.
You're welcome. Be joyful. Are you backlogged as a result of uh, COVID on your processing of the various applications? Not that I'm aware of, sir. No? Okay. Do you have enough staff to keep up with Well, we, we have asked for another staff person in the budget, and I think that will make everything very well. You know, right now, you know, it fluctuates. And so sometimes you might get 20 some applications in one month, then you might only get 10 in the next month. But, you know, when you, again, in my experience, one thing that is difficult with planning and zoning, we deal with a lot of legal issues, we deal, a lot, deal with a lot of challenging issues. And when you're really trying to do a review of an application to the level that it requires, when, when you have to say, we have 30 days to do this, or maybe it's 21 days to do this, you can't always get to the level of detail and checking things the way you might like to because it, it kind of goes to press, it goes to the planning commission, you get that out. So I think having that extra person will allow us to spend additional time on each application, give them the time that they require and they deserve to make sure they're getting a thorough review. Not that we're not now, but it'll make it a little more tolerable. And um, in your review of the zoning uh, ordinance that you mentioned earlier, do you anticipate revision and reduction of the number of conditional use categories, or do you have do you see a trend there, or what what is your thoughts on yeah, the conditional well, use seems like it's certainly not black and white, but it could be more black and white. <laughs> I think so. There, there are a lot of uses in our table of permitted uses that require conditional uses. Now, I don't know the entire philosophy in the past with the city, but but there are more than I would think would be you know, necessary. And so I think part of our review will be to take a look at everything that's a conditional use and say, okay, why is this listed as a conditional use? Does it make sense? And in those situations where it doesn't make sense, we probably bring a recommendation to change that. We got, um, that's one of the things a year ago when Steve was, was brought on board, that was one of the things that he and I talked about and we've been talking about it all year and Steve has 30 years plus of planning experience and has seen a lot and, and I, as a, the longest tenured planner at the City of Auburn, strongly believe we need to take a hard look at that. So ultimately staff needs to look, talk to planning commission, they'll come to the council, but um, it is, there are times that conditional uses may not be necessary, the very brief history of it is is that every site plan in the city um, conditional or not used to have to go through the Planning Commission and it was a tremendous volume of paperwork staff is still reviewing all of those things but there was no legal reason to put it through the Planning Commission other than the zoning ordinance said so and so <clears throat> part of Planning Commission's lens at the time was well if we're not going to review all the site plans we now need to have a lot of conditional uses um, in feedback from a lot of different people. It's very confusing to our average citizen, let alone those in the development community. Um, and I feel strongly we need to take a very hard look. And Steve is poised and he's got money in his budget to deal with that and some consultants to deal with other things to help free up staff capacity to get to all the things they need to get to. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, our city engineer, Allison Fraser, Engineering Services, she's excited. I'm excited. <laughs> she is going to give you a scintillating presentation. <laughs> As she always does. No pressure. No pressure, Allison. Well, everybody else has almost covered everything I was going to say. So oh, that's <laughs> But look, you have squiggly lines in your picture. Yeah. There you go. I did that for uh, Councilman that's Dawson, and he's not right here. here. So. <laughs> I'm Allison. I'm very glad to be here and uh, just want to tell you a little bit about our department, what we've been doing over the past couple of years. We are uh, extremely busy. We're staff, it's a pretty small staff of 25. We've got two co-op students that alternate through semesters. So uh, Becky kind of stole my thunder, but it's okay, Becky. Uh, some key accomplishments over the past couple of years from the Parks and Rec Cultural Master Plan. Uh, we completed Sam Harris, we did the Frank Brown Center Edition, uh, Town Creek Inclusive Playground. We're currently working on the Soccer Complex Edition, and we are currently working through the Boykin uh, programming. Allison, real quickly, what is the role that you play in, I was in your department? Oh, yes, there. no, no, okay. I, I'll start, as I started talking, I thought I should have said that. So our role is to take a project really from inception to construction. If uh, like the projects that came out of the Parks and Rec Master Plan, they were just ideas. Uh, they were concepts done by a consultant, and it was our responsibility to get the designs done, uh, contracts, and the project management, and then make Becky very happy. So uh, that's what we do. Uh, we also have used some, done some projects for my comprehensive traffic study. 
that skip were completed in 2018, and those have been some tourmaline projects at North Dominion and Jordan, North College in Shug. Um, we complete the Tumor Thomas Two Way project, which has been fairly successful, a few uh, violators. Um, and currently, we are waiting still on poles to put at the College and Shell Tumor Parkway intersection. Sorry, Allison. Al got finally warned to that. Um, it's been something that's been on our radar for several years. The South College and Sanford project is actually from our 2010 uh, comprehensive traffic study that Skipper did. And thanks to ALDOT, it's taking us 12 years to get it done. So it's currently underway. And we're completing the design of the Anderloo Drive, Sagatachi Road, and Megan mentioned that um, on Monday. We are near a completion of our right away discussions. Some other things we've done. Um, our roundabout, it was our very first one in the city. I was I was very nervous. I was excited at the same time, but scared to death almost because I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. Um, but it's been a success. It's provided better traffic movement at Cox and Wire. Fire Station 6 is a facility we're managing for the Public Safety Department. It is nearing completion. We finally kicked off our Will Beekner Parkway, which we also call a new connector road. And uh, I think on Monday, I think Megan or Scott mentioned our right-of-way assessment project, something that we've been talking about for a little while. So I'm excited to get the results and see what our right-of-way looks like. Dan is going to be very busy here in the next few years, um, maintaining all of our streets as well, as well as our infrastructure. The new environmental services and public works complex, again, just another facility project that we're maintaining. Uh, our fiber expansion for traffic signals. Is, is something we've been working on. We're actually working on some post analysis of the data now to see how um, our SPMs are working. Exit 50, landscaping and lighting. It's a project we're working on with ALDOT and it is about 90% complete. The lights are on, most of the landscaping is done. I think there's one pole left to set. Um, and Dan mentioned uh, that's gonna be a new maintenance responsibility for him shortly. Exit 57 is actually bidding in a couple of weeks, so we'll know who that contractor is and what those costs are going to be. And then a project we're working on with Alabama Power, and it's a project we started on a couple of years ago, is converting our streetlights to LED. And that's been pretty successful. We've actually had a couple of calls that the lights are too bright, um, but Alabama Power is not going to convert them back to the old stop. So. Um, one of the things we've done, uh, one of the charges uh, City Manager Buston and Megan gave me when they um, had me in this, put me in this position was to establish some partnerships. So over the past year, we've been able to do that through private developments and some public partnerships. The bid law allows us to partner <coughs> with developers and we're getting infrastructure that we need and we would have done anyway. Um, but like the Mooresville Hamilton Road Infrastructure Project, that's a partnership with Albany Community Church. They're there doing lighting work along Hamilton Road. We wanted some improvements and the city participated in that. Uh, and the same for the Landings Academy. Uh, we're getting a portion of the Greenway plan that we would have ultimately had to build ourselves as well as a portion of our major street plan and bikeway plan accomplished. And uh, Gay Street, Streetscape. At Auburn Bank. That, that we did that that works that's a that's a Auburn Bank was the first yeah. actually there is the reason she hesitated is as of today um, I have canceled um, in the vicinity of Publix the streetscape project there at Gay Street um, we're not able to complete that um, we were going to partner with the contract in time for football season and so I'm not willing to tear all that sidewalk out by very active businesses and a church um, and hope it gets done on time we can't guarantee delivery by football season so we won't be proceeding with that project, but leave the sidewalk as is till another project comes along. Uh, as other projects come along that are part of our major street plan, um, Scott mentioned our, our connector road, Will Beaker Parkway, was done in partnership with the Bladesville Lake Development. We also um, have done a, a couple of new things over the past year, and that's the use of program managers and Temple Manager Services. So the program managers, we've used for program management. Uh, we started them with the Environmental Services and Public Works Complex, and we're also using them on the Boykin Project. Just to shore up our staff, um, you know, doing the programming with the department heads, figuring out the space needs, 
coordinating with those consultants. And it's been a, a very large success. And Temple Managed Services, uh, the county approved a contract some time ago. And they are doing some day-to-day -day management of our traffic control center, uh, troubleshooting. If there's an accident on the interstate, we can call them. They can adjust timings on our signals on the fly to help traffic move quicker than town. Um, and kind of what I started with was that we work with all departments. And some of the other departments have talked about things we've done together. And it's one of the it's one of the highlights of my job because I get to, to hang out with Katrina, I get to hang out with Allison and Eric and do all kinds of things and make their I won't say dreams a reality, but uh, and Steve, he's waiting for that. I'm gonna do something for Kristen one day. Yeah. Um, but we get to take the <clears throat> excuse me, the ideas of what these departments need and what they want and do them within budget. Right, Megan? All right. <laughs> 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 we have some colorful <laughs> conversations about the budget. Yes. <clears throat> excuse me. So just some numbers of uh, what we do. And I will admit that as I was putting this together, when I, when I do this, I am overwhelmed by what my staff does. Um, I'm overwhelmed by some of the other presentations today. Um, we do a lot of stuff in uh, not a lot of time uh, with a few people. But part of our role, as I said, is mainly to manage capital projects. We've got about $55 million, a little bit over $55 million right now in construction contracts. Um, Five million in professional services agreements. Um, Eric mentioned new water lines and new sewer lines. Our inspectors inspect every water line, every sewer line, we test it, we um, make sure that it's suitable for um, consumption. So over the past couple of years, you'll see we've done close to two miles, 45,000 feet of water, 51,000 feet of sanitary sewer. Now that doesn't count every test, every retest, every manhole. We test manholes on private developments to make sure there's no infiltration. So those numbers are not included in that. Um, we maintain over 5,300 regulatory street signs with two people, that's just one person. Um, our DRT caseload has increased over the past few years. Uh, Megan actually mentioned that the other night, the other day. We've processed about a thousand cases since we started the ERT in 2006. Uh, we actually received four submittals last week and that's kind of been the trend this year. We'll get two or three submittals a week. So it's a lot of our staff and we have one person who manages that project. We're about to have two. We're about to have two. Thank you. Very council much. Approves it. Um, one of the other things that we do that's not on the slide, we manage subdivision completion bonds. So when the city council approves a final plat, um, we have a subdivision completion bond that guarantees that the infrastructure will be completed before the development is complete or if the development goes out of developer goes out of business. We have 68 of those currently in our queue. That infrastructure is not yet on the books for public parks. So in a few years, we'll have 68 new subdivisions. Those are each, excuse me, typically phases of a subdivision or brand new ones that eventually will become the responsibility of the city to maintain the stormwater, the sidewalks, the curb, and the roads. So that will go to public works very soon. I'm talking really fast. All right. So what's next? Uh, I like that picture. That's the soccer complex before we started. So maybe in another year or so, we'll show you what it looks like when it's finished. But our plan is just to continue emphasis on the traffic flow of management. That was one of the things in the citizen survey. We'll continue to inspect private and public projects. And thank you, Megan, for recommending a new inspector in 24. Um, we'll continue to look at our development review process and make sure that as developments are coming in, and hopefully with the new person, we're spending that time that Steve just mentioned. Um, it's a little bit difficult now when Dan gets four submittals in a week. He not only coordinates our individual department review, but he has to take all the comments from the other review departments, compile all of that, and get it to the developer. Um, doesn't include the pre-app meetings, it doesn't include the plan commission items that we've already looked at. So development review is a, is a robust item for us. And then we'll continue to look at innovative and cost-effective designs for projects, uh, all within budget, of course. Is that for Any questions? 
Now, since you talked about your staff and how much work y'all get done, um, you've asked, made a request for two additional staff. I mean, you feel good that there's two additional people going to carry you forward yes. with the volume of work you have to do? Yes, definitely. Especially on the development review side, again, it's hard to, and I think I was having this conversation with Megan, no, sorry, it was Kristen, quantifying the times we deal with the development. Um, we had a pre-op meeting today for something. So we could have a pre-op meeting today. Some time may pass. Um, we may have another meeting. All of, and we probably meet on something four to five times before we actually get the engineering plans. Once we get the plans and the comments are sent, that's a whole nother set of correspondence before it's actually <coughs> reviewed and approved before it goes to a pre-construction meeting. So we touch developments now more than we used to. So would that be helpful? Now it trickles down to planning, water resource management, and inspection services. So one of the things that we did on the capital side is in the last several years, Allison's gained one, one project manager and we converted a position making it clear from the inspection side to the project management side and that's their sole job. And then we're adding in the development review period in the, in the middle 2000s, 2004, 5, 6, and then on into the recession in 8 and 9, we had a lot of questions about do you have too many engineers and water resource management and engineering services? And since then, we've been a little gun shy about adding any because a lot of the private sector had much to say about it. I've sat through a series of meetings, several of us did this spring, and listened to a lot of developers, builders, et cetera, talk. And one of the things that we identified is um, we're not slow per se, but we have a high volume of plans. So I want to make sure that I'm recommending somebody to you that not only do we need that as fluctuations in the economy happen, they still have things to do and we can always pivot these are engineers to doing more in-house design and other things should development review slow, slow down but we haven't added an engineer to the staff probably since the development review engineer right in, in the engineering <coughs> services side so it's time based on our growth and we've probably grown 35 40 thousand people since we added an engineer so and the inspector goes tandem with the volume of infrastructure her inspectors inspect all of our <coughs> infrastructure um, and that, that's infrastructure that the city will end up owning. So they're making sure that that's done right as we take those assets on and that it meets all criteria. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Alice. You have inspection people as well as John has inspection people. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we do the infrastructure. We do the roads, the sidewalks, the streets, the water, the sewer, the sanitation, the sewer lines, the water 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 you, know, you call me with erosion control complaints about complaints about something in a new subdivision or somebody just building an infill lot. Usually, a lot by itself is a John John Moore inspection services and a massive the undertaking of the infrastructure for the whole subdivision would be Eric's team. So that's why you call me and then we delve it out. But it's it's split up depending on the type of project. Thanks, Allison. All right, that was the last in the development services business unit. We just have coming police and fire, and right now we have Chief Cedric Anderson. He's, like, he's excited. He's in his uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I always tease him when he wears his uniform because he mixes it up on me. Sometimes it's a suit, sometimes it's a uniform. <laughs> yeah, I like it. There you go. Right, Chief, I like you. Good evening. Um, I'm going to be brief, so uh, we'll move right along. But before I, I get started, what I want to do is, is thank just about everybody in this room. I don't think there's anybody in this room that I have not benefited from in my career. Uh, you know, starting with my boss, May, and everybody else in here. You guys have helped me to, to get my job done and to, to kind of guide the police department in the direction that it needs to go. I don't think there's a department in here that I have not called on in my time as the, as the chief and, and got direction and, and got the assistance that I need. So thank all of you for, for what you contributed to, to me and to the police department. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, getting us started, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is just us maintaining our standards. Over the last uh, couple of years, there have been a lot of things going on across the country that have impacted law enforcement. <clears throat> so. With that being said, a lot of agencies um, changed their, their, their processes, they, they changed their standards, and they, they started doing things to, to, to alter their, their end product to provide the best police service possible. We decided we were not going to do that in Auburn. And one of the reasons we decided that is based on the feedback we were getting from citizens. 
we were getting calls and we were getting emails from citizens on a regular basis talking about how well our officers were performing, how, how, how they appreciated the job that they were doing. So we didn't see a need to change what we were doing. And that was kind of supported by uh, the, the citizen survey. Uh, it's supported by you know, just uh, so many other things we're hearing from the, the, the community about the way our people are performing. So stay in, stay in the course and, and, and maintain our standards is really important to us throughout all of this. And I think we're, we're, we're starting to, to really reap some benefits from it. Um, we've uh, recently uh, launched some, some uh, social media platforms. We've launched a uh, public safety app. Uh, we've also launched the, the social media sites. We have uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, just to name a, a couple of them. And that is maintained by a uh, public relations specialist, and she's doing a great job for us. We wanted to, to launch those sites because we, we felt like we wanted to, to get the, the message out that we wanted to get out about how our folks were performing, the services were provided to the community, and that is a, a great resource and a great way to get that uh, pushed out so that we say it in our own words and we're, we're delivering the message the way we want it to be uh, delivered. Uh, we've expanded our uh, motor unit um, in, over the last year. We felt like that was an important thing to do because uh, traffic is, is one of the major concerns in the, in the city. And we, we increased our number of motor officers and we put them out on the street now. And they're used, you probably see them on occasion out working traffic and doing things uh, from an enforcement uh, standpoint. And it has it is, uh, been very beneficial to us. Uh, we've expanded our canine unit. Uh, that is, has been something we've been talking about over the, over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, the goal was to have a K-9 unit on every shift. Uh, we also have K-9s on the AU campus. Uh, we have K-9s down in the school. We're getting ready to have an additional K-9 in the, in the school, hopefully. Uh, and we're, so we'll have, you know, dual dogs over on the, the, the Auburn City School campuses. So that's going to be a, a huge benefit to us. Uh, we have two officers, uh, our SROs, that have been recognized uh, here recently for the work they've done over the last uh, year. And as Officer Fant and Officer Bryan, uh, both of them were recognized by the, the state SRO organization. Uh, and there's there's hundreds of officers in that, that organization. <laughs> there are two officers from Auburn to be recognized. That's, a, that's an accomplishment. These guys work hard to keep the school safe. And uh, they've been working uh, diligently to, 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 you know, support the schools and do whatever is needed over there to keep our kids safe. And uh, it, it, it has gotten them these uh, these awards that they they earned. Uh, Officer Bryan has been recognized also on a national level. There's only six officers out of the thousands of SROs across the country that are going to be receiving that award. And we have an officer right here in Auburn who's going to be getting it because of his efforts in our, our school system. Uh, we've uh, launched Eagle Watch. Our Eagle Watch program is something that uh, we felt would give us a leg up on, on helping to solve crime here in Auburn. Uh, participants can, can register with this program and what it does is it gives us the ability to access uh, security cameras, uh, people who have ring doorbells, any of that stuff. Uh, they can register with us and, and give us the permissions to, to access and if something happens in, in a neighborhood or in a business or near a business, we can access and see what was going on, what, what if any video footage we can retrieve that's going to help us to, to investigate and, uh, and solve crime. So that, that is a, a, a great program and it's uh, already starting to, to reap some benefits for us. Um, we've increased the number of officers that are certified to teach and instruct. Uh, we felt like that was, that was important. We're very thankful to the city manager for increasing uh, our, our budget, our training budget in that, uh, that aspect. Because what we want to do is we want to we want to start training our folks to do things the Auburn way. A lot of times, you know, you hear about good training and you see, send your, your your folks off to get that training, but you're not sure exactly what the what the, the you know message is when they get to these these different training sites. We know what we want to teach them here at Auburn, so it's important for us to get our, our folks trained up so that they can teach that next generation. So that what we're doing, we see it's being successful. We want to keep that going, so it's important for us to do it. So we see it now with our, our de-escalation techniques. Uh, we have a number of officers now that we have, we've gotten certified in de-escalation. We can teach that in-house. Uh, we have uh, agencies that are now sending their folks to us to, to be trained in, in uh, that, that particular uh, subject. 
we increase the, the number of officers that we have that can teach motors. In years past, we've always had to send folks off to the state to be trained to do that, but now we can do it here. And again, people are, are wanting to sign up to get us to teach their officers how to do it. So we know we're we're teaching it right because you know it's it's our folks that are, are doing it. Um, we have everyone down there from the, the, the rank of, of lieutenant and above who is now certified to teach uh, the civilian response to active shooter. That is the next level of the, the run, hide, fight uh, training that uh, they're, they're teaching in schools to, for active shooter situations. So that is, is something that uh, we launched last week. We had 19 uh, people show up. Uh, we got a bunch of positive feedback from it. Everybody thought it was great. Uh, great training and so now uh, this week we've started uh, getting phone calls from all over the place people wanting to come and see if they can be a part of this so that they can they can learn uh, what they need to do in the event of an active shooter situation uh, the civilian response in that we we feel is very important so we want to teach people we don't want them to to, to wait on us just to get there and and, and do what we're going to do but it's important for people to start realizing they have to formulate a plan from, from day one. Don't wait till you're in that situation to think in advance how you need to respond when you walk into places, find your exits, find what, what your exit strategy is gonna be if something were to jump off. That's the stuff we're teaching them in this, this particular uh, training. Uh, we have a number of officers. We, we've now uh, got trained in the, uh, the Grace of Survival Tactics. That's uh, based on uh, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, if I can say it right. And what that does, we've had a, a number of officers uh, over the, the, the last couple of years who, who kind of tweak things, hurt things while, while scuffling with uh, suspects. So this, instead of uh, doing strikes and that kind of stuff, this is, this is grappling stuff that when, when you are on the ground tussling with someone, you can put various holes and moves on them that will, will restrain them until your backup gets there. It's, uh, it's, it's low impact, you're not doing any, any kicks or anything like that, but it, it benefits our guys because it cuts down on the, the, the number of people that uh, we, we have hurt and we don't have to hurt anyone. These holes uh, aren't, aren't meant to, to, to hurt or injure anybody. So that is <clears throat> something else we're doing to, to uh, I guess, grow our footprint in the, in the training and, and instruction area. Um, some of our, our metrics, um, in, the, in the fiscal year 2021, uh, we handled a total of 242,000 calls. Those are calls that are, are actually assigned or tasked to an officer. That's just not a call that came into the, to the communication center. Uh, uh, an officer was assigned to that. Somebody did something on every one of those calls. So that, that to me is an impressive number. We have, we have people working that hard. In one year, they did that much work. Uh, our uh, security checks, residential and business, that is something that we, it's a mainstay for us. We, we want people to, to always feel safe in their, their homes and in their businesses. And uh, we, we check residents and businesses on, on regular, especially when people are out of town. You don't have to be out of town to get us to come check, but we're gonna, we're gonna do it if you, you call and tell us you, you want us to. And uh, so we do a, a large amount of that. Uh, I just want to circle back that uh, 242,000 calls, uh, a little over 60,000 of those were actually on campus. So almost a, a, a quarter of what we're doing is uh, for the university community. So we do a, a, a lot over there uh, and our numbers were reflected when we, when we sat down and, and start tallying everything up. As far as extra duty details, uh, we spent over $8,000 not 8,000, 8,000 hours in the fiscal year 2021 uh, doing extra duty assignments, extra duty jobs. And when you consider how much these guys already work, that's a, that's a, a lot of extra stuff, extra time that they're putting in. Uh, as far as our traffic stops go, 25,000 traffic stops in, in the, the fiscal year. Um, 27,000 arrests. Uh, when it comes to those arrests, um, numbers are, are, are not covering what, what our, our detectives do. Uh, what our detectives do, our detectives were actually assigned uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 1,100 cases during that, that, that same time frame, uh, 2021. And of those cases, they submitted uh, a little over 121 case files to the district attorney's office. Those are cases that they, they actually resolved. 
but uh, to have a thousand cases assigned to those guys in one year and for them to work those cases and, and, and be able to, to get the, the, the type of follow-up that they did, they're doing a tremendous job down there uh, and, and their, their solvability rate is just about uh, through the roof. Uh, as far as our accidents go, uh, yeah, we worked a lot of accidents and we're, we're, we're trying to push more and more uh, traffic enforcement out there to cut down on, on some of that. Um, as far as, as some of the things we're doing, we're trying to, to, to invest in, in technology. Technology right now, data and technology is driving law enforcement. So a lot of what we've tried to do over the last uh, couple of years is invest in uh, the, the technology that, that's going to help our folks to, to do, the, do their jobs better and be better at it, be more efficient. Uh, a couple of days ago, you heard the director talk about uh, the FARO system that we're getting. And that FARO system is a, a really neat device. It, it cuts down on the amount of time that uh, an officer or an investigator has to be on the scene, uh, diagramming and scaling what's going on. Uh, with, with that FARO system, you just hit the button and uh, that thing will, will, will do a 3D uh, diagram of it. If you were to take that 3D diagram and go into court, you can use it to, to explain to the jury exactly what went on. Uh, if, if you have a, a, a witness who says, well, hey, I was standing behind the car and I saw this guy do something to the other guy. Well, you can spin that 3D image around showing the, the jury exactly where that person was standing and what they would have been able to see from their vantage point. So if, if they were only, you know, five foot two and the, the truck they were looking over was well over six foot tall, then you know there's no way they were able to do that. So it's a, it's a great tool. And uh, like I said, it only takes a few minutes to, to diagram <coughs> any, any scene. Uh, one of the other things we're looking at doing is uh, getting the uh, LexisNexis uh, software uh, and program installed down there. That is a, a, a system that will, will give us the ability to, to track people and, and make connections uh, with them and, and, and kind of follow their footprints where they're going uh, as far as social media and, and that kind of stuff. But it, it, it helps us to, to, to do it, especially with people that aren't necessarily in a, a criminal database somewhere. Uh, we, we were able to, to, to use this to just a, a couple of days ago when we were, we were having some of the department heads getting unpleasant phone calls and, and, and threats and that kind of stuff. We were able to use some of this, this technology to, to determine where a person was in this country. You know, they weren't here, they were out in Las Vegas, but this was, this was part of what we were, we were using to, to do that. Uh, and this is, this is the kind of stuff that we're, we're trying to incorporate and bring into to what we do as, as law enforcement officers and move our department ahead so that we can keep up with the, the, the changing times and provide the best police service that we possibly can. So, any questions? Chief, I just think about y'all all the time. Auburn has become such a busy community and every week there's some big event coming to Auburn for the weekend are gonna happen. Um, I just, I'm grateful every time I see you guys out there your staff out there. I mean, just Monday night, there was, I, don't know, I went downtown after the baseball game, and 500 people down there. 10 o'clock, and you had three people down there, and they had everything under control, and everybody was behaving. But just things like that pop up in Auburn all the time, and y'all are always flexible and get there, and keep us protected and great. Well, thank you, sir. And, and like I say, one of the things that I always try to do whenever I see y'all out is, is thank you for your support. And, and, and those guys, they, they do realize how supportive you, the council, everybody is of what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish. So again, I, I thank you for that, and uh, I'm just appreciative of the, uh, the opportunity. So thank you. Chief, real quick before you go, um, Mr. Griswold mentioned yesterday we were talking about personnel. It went through 15 or so, you know, additional officers two years ago, I suppose. And I know, you know, I know all the restrictions or limitations in trying to fill those spots. Do you think? Um, I guess this is anecdotal, but do you think you're on a, you know, in a pattern or a trajectory? You'll be able to. I mean, you comfortable the way um, though that search is going? Um, and is there anything that can be done, uh, really, to, to help it aid in filling those spots? Uh, well, About eight five hundred hours of, of overtime. Yeah, I, I think that we are comfortable, and I'm talking with me and the command staff, I think we're very comfortable in the way things are going right now. I think we're on the right trajectory. Um, we look at other things and not just the 
numbers. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know a lot of people lately, they, they put stock in, well, you know, you, you guys don't have all your positions filled. We don't, but when you compare what we do to other places, and, and what I mean by comparing, is if you look at the, the UCR, uh, FBI UCR numbers, the, the, the UCR report will, will show you that the city of Auburn performs better than any other agency within a, a 150 miles here. You know, we are below the national average in just about every crime statistic you can name. And that's the result of, of what those guys are doing. So it's not about the, the, the numbers. We're, we're doing great just, just like we are. Will we be doing better when we get fully staffed? Yes, we will. And we're, we're I talked to uh, Chief Stewart earlier today, and he's he's very confident. We're, we're going back out. We, we, we've changed some things. One of the things we've changed is the, the, the length of time it takes us to, to go through a hiring process. Uh, in years past, we, we took probably two, three months to get through a hiring process. We've cut that back now to just a, a few weeks. You know, we can, we can start to finish, be through with it within a few weeks. The, the problem, and it's not a problem, the, the issue that we're, we're, we're facing is, is not wanting to, to lower our standards. Well, it, it, listen, I'm the biggest proponent of putting the right person in there. And you know, you can't just... We feel spot, and so I, you know, I appreciate those efforts, and that's much more important to me than anything. I just want to make sure you're not being handcuffed by anything we can help with. No, sir, we're not. Uh, like I said, we've had we've had hundreds of applicants over the, the the last couple of years, and if we wanted to just go out and say, hey, we're gonna just fill fill slots and, and, and be done with it, we could have done it a long time ago. But I think it's unfair to the citizens if we were to do something like that. They're not getting like, the quality, you know law enforcement officer that we feel they deserve. So we want to take our time to make sure we're doing it right. And based on the numbers, we really haven't lost it. That's well, I appreciate that more than anything. Nelson, you want to explain extra duty. A lot of that also includes churches, businesses. Well, other contractual, folks. You know, you're, you're getting supplemental pay for that. <laughs> right, and, no, and they're, they're requesting those services. Yeah. There is sensitivity on the city manager's part. Uh, police will do anything I ask them to do from an overtime perspective. Mm -hmm. But we do become sensitive to downtown road closures this year. I requested that we cap the number of events, unless we a national championship or something. It's not what I mean. <laughs> They're special um, and rare. But um, we're capping the number of events, trying to cut back on that. I'm trying to be sensitive. Everybody works every football game. Um, that's mandatory. And so one of the things we try to do, everybody's got families and personal obligations, is try to cut back on what is mandatory over time and when I'm asking for that. There are times that we will embrace events in the city and our, we have such a wonderful group of people. Um, they embrace what the city needs to do. They're happy to, to protect and serve in that way, but we are sensitive to that. And I can tell you our human resources department has also worked tirelessly with police. We have adjusted salaries um, twice in the last several years, pay scale, and once, once. Kristen, you can go ahead and just say once. Um, we've been adjusting, <laughs> we've been adjusting that. We have looked, you know, everything from benefits to what we're offering. I felt strongly the chief didn't come to me with what I felt was a big enough um, training budget. We've added to that to make sure, um, and it's not that there was inadequate training. I want the ability for them to, to do more. Um, and so we acknowledge that it is tough out there. Um, this part of the country and the city vehemently supports our police and fire. Um, not everybody in my role is, has that luxury of a community that feels that strongly and a council that does. Um, and so there, there are some challenges nationally that, that kind of trickle on down. But overall, um, we're doing a good job. We're also changing some things. Um, we, we do recruitment in, what, what do you call it? It's not bunches. It's in groups. Yes. Yeah. And we're changing how? Yes. We're going to allow a continuous now. Some people ask periodically, why do you not have, if you have these vacancies, <coughs> just wide open on your website all the time? Because we do things in groups and we're changing a little bit about how we do that. But we have to have a beginning and end for some applicants that are not going to be selected. And that is what we've been, there needs to be an end for the applicants that aren't going to move forward in the process. And we're correcting that and yes. moving forward with a new process. Well, I'd rather pay 10,000 extra hours in overtime with the right people than the trying to hurry, so I, I follow those efforts for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. I, I, I would just say that I would like to say that thanks to all the things that the council has approved over the years as city managers, you know, I will say that Chief Anderson is operating right now with more police officers than we've ever had. 
so that doesn't need to get lost. We do have some vacancies, but through the additions over the years, we've, we've climbed to a point where he is actually, he has more police officers on, on the road right now than we've ever had. He has, and, and you also have part-time officers too that we did not have years ago. So that there are more police officers than there have ever been in Auburn, but we are striving to, to get those numbers. And with the help of everybody involved, we, I think we will. All right, and last but certainly not least is Chief John Langford with Auburn Fire Department. One of the things I want to remind the council of, it's new to say department, these have long been divisions. And in October 1, at the start of the fiscal year, these became departments, um, with the public safety departments now a business unit. So it's new to the chiefs to be department heads and be making their own budget presentations. Usually the public safety director does it. So, here we go, Chief. Thank you, appreciate you having me. Thank you for giving me the time to speak to you all today. Um, first, I just want to highlight the excellent, great job that the men and women of the fire department have done. I kind of look back, basically, the last biennium, and, you know, we, we, we went through a pandemic. I, I don't mean to harp on that, but um, we didn't really have any guidelines or plans to respond to someone that was sick with this crazy flu. Um, but at no time did we service the sucker. Um, the men and women performed admirably. Um, they had to come to work. They had to ride on the fire engine. They had to go to that person that had COVID. Um, we made a plan. They wore the proper PPE. Um, we did all the right things to keep them safe and um, do the best for the uh, citizens of Baltimore. So uh, thank you to them for uh, doing such a good job. Uh, like the slide says, we just kept going. There was no lapse in our service. Um, calling around to colleagues, um, hiring and training most cities, most fire departments pretty much put everything on hold. Um, and we did. So um, the last little note on that was we hired 33 firefighters in the last year, and the request or proposal to transition some of those part-time employees is kind of a direct reflection of that. Um, so, and before I click to the next slide, I just want to reiterate, we've said it before, but our new public safety building, that's the fire station side. Um, thank you all for your support and um, it's, night and day from what we used to I remember five years ago, maybe the council two or through and it was, we were all crossing our fingers. But I appreciate your support. <laughs> no, I appreciate you having a great attitude. <laughs> <laughs> it was from what, 1964? That's okay. <laughs> um, so it's been mentioned a couple of times this is actually a pretty new picture. We had a couple of little hangups on our roof, so um, they're doing that. I had a meeting today out there, and they're going to finish over the truck bay probably next week. They're pouring the front right there where you see that lull today or tomorrow. Um, so it's come along. Um, I believe we have a ribbon cutting July 19th. I didn't release that date. <laughs> so. <laughs> Top secret. There we go. Mom's <laughs> <laughs> out now. Surprise! <laughs> my, my point being, we're on schedule here. Edit that out. Uh, <laughs> we're on schedule. Yeah, and that, that is subject to change. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, we have all the equipment purchased, ready to go. We have the personnel hired and trained. Um, Chief Anderson mentioned it. Um, also, we have a public safety um, specialist that helps us with uh, social media and community outreach. So that's new to us and it's been great. Um, she has helped out a lot recently, very recently, with um, recruiting on our university campus. So that helps out a lot. Um, and then just us having a presence out there, we can send out you know, 
um, feel good stuff, and then alert safety alerts and stuff like that. So, if you looked at a um, bar graph of our calls, it's it's about five percent each year. Um, 2021 was 68, 48 total emergency calls that we responded on. Um, so, busiest in the history, and each year I guess it's just going to continue that way. Um, I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, training and certificate classes. We have top-notch instructors, instructors that teach locally um, for our people, for neighboring departments. Um, and then we also have instructors through the Alabama Fire College teach all over the U.S. So um, those are 15 one-week classes. Um, so you know during a COVID period, that's that's pretty good. Like I said, we we kept the ball rolling um, when many maybe just kind of took a breath and didn't do much, and we we kept going. So. Um, So the previous slide said we had Station 6's personnel already hired and trained, so I don't want to say there were extra people at Station 1, but they were working and able to kind of do a test for us on what we call it, a sprint truck, um, essentially a rescue truck. Um, and if you looked at our call volumes in the morning, there's lots of medical calls that are back to back. So basically the test was to see if it was beneficial to have that extra <coughs> unit be able to respond and what we found was it was very useful. Um, if we get back to the ladder truck response just to any type of call that it is and that prevented some of that just because lots of times calls are back to back. So. Um, freed up a little bit of engine one's responsibility, a little bit of engine twos and fours and threes. They, we kind of gave them the response zone of the loop inside the loop. So, um, anyway, we found that very beneficial. So, the majority of the time, what are we doing? 4,600 medical calls. Um, sometimes we're asked, why do we do that? We do it because we have fire stations strategically spread out throughout the city and we can beat the ambulance there you know nothing off them they have a spot on sugar door and a spot on that like and we have we're, we're covered so um, we can get there first generally and establish patient care start doing what we need to do ambulance comes in very smooth transition from the big get in the back of the ambulance and go to the hospital so if you saw it working it's it's, it's very fluid and we have a, a good working relationship. Life safety inspections, there's about 2,500 businesses in Auburn. We only did 853, mainly because of COVID. Um, we were just trying to limit our exposure so we didn't get you know, sick and obviously the business owners. Um, so we prioritized those into high hazard occupancies or businesses. Um, so that number is a little bit low than, lower than what you would think. And we did 132 public education events, fire drills, fire safety talks, fire extinguisher training at um, industrial parks and stuff like that. So what else do we do? Um, I say we're an all hazard agency. We're going to respond to anything that you ask us to go to. Um, hazmat call you know we actually don't go to cats and trees anymore but um, we have 50 building fires so that's a fire in someone's structure business or home um, 132 outside of buildings 30 vehicle fires 4600 EMS calls alarms I would say uh, 800 of those are on campus. <laughs> we go there a lot. Um, we actually did print up a bunch of flyers for um, Camp Oregon. You know, 
how to use a microwave and um, hazardous material related incidents and then miscellaneous just stuff that <laughs> you can have a fire station on campus anytime in the foreseeable future. I, I'm not sure. Um, the city manager chooses to, and y'all choose well, to. I think the the conversation that the, is that there's open communication that had also been discussed. Um, President Roberts met with our public safety team the very first day, the first four hours he was in office. Um, we had lunch with him. He's a, he's aware of that, and I think the conversation with General Burgess and President Roberts are on, ongoing. I think it's something we're interested in, um, but that also doesn't mean that we're adding a fire station. We may we may move, move one of our fire stations that's on Shook Durden Parkway to that location. Um, so those those discussions are ongoing, and I expect as President Roberts gets his feet on the ground, and we have more discussions with facilities and General Burgess that will will continue that dialogue. And the location of Station Six, it would benefit Station Two sliding towards Stanford, you know, mile down the road. We we have circles, and we just plot them around the stations and to help figure out where we need. Chief's also been kind of talking about a little bit about um, the Sprint truck, but that is where you will be seeing, unless Paul Register tells me no. Um, we, we will have the rescue truck purchased from the Smith Station Fire Authority on the council agenda. You'll see that tomorrow afternoon. So that's moving forward with that to have some different capabilities that we need due to our growing market. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. I'll make this short few points and my good staff I'm sure is ready to get dinner and you guys are. Um, council members, the budget for what we have tomorrow, I'll email you as usual. We'll have our regular packet meeting that we've got that's already upon us. We've had budget sessions, but tomorrow at four o'clock will be our usual. Join by phone or in person. Um, you will see the budget ordinance on the agenda on Tuesday. We put that together. If you have questions, um, we have a couple council members, Councilman Dawson. Um, and Councilman Parsons long um, we were not able to attend I will bring both of them up to speed at a talk with Councilman Dawson this morning and Councilman Parsons is just returning to town after a long plan family vacation so I'm going to do everything I can to get him up to speed these videos are publicly available but I'll also meet with them talk on the phone do whichever sorry to receive some questions from some of you staff is happy to answer those we're trying to turn them around as quickly as possible to get you information Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, this is like the fourth time I've been able to go through this process, and of course, I didn't expect that we would talk about fruit trees <laughs> or where the cats in Connie's neighborhood have gone. <laughs> but I'm not surprised at the professionalism and the effort that everybody in this room put towards this, and I'm grateful for you. Um, it just reaffirms that we've got great people in this town who care deeply about how the city works and how the citizens are served. And uh, I know I'm certainly really grateful for that. I just want to tell you where I think, where this will probably go on Tuesday so you'll understand where our intentions are. Um, this is a lot of information. Um, Kelly's retired, didn't have anything else to do, so he's read through it all, got to take notes everywhere. But the rest of us, uh, our days are interrupted sometimes. And so for us as lay people to go through and totally understand all that by Tuesday night where we can with confidence pass a budget on behalf of our citizens um, is probably a little bit of a stretch. But also just as important, our citizens um, have not had their time to consume this. And so traditionally we have um, denied the unanimous consent on that first reading. And all that does is avail everybody a little more time to go through and study. I don't want y'all to ever think that that's any lack of confidence in the work and the efforts that you put into what's in these binders because it is top notch. Um, it's just our um, effort to try to understand and really comprehend and then give our citizens who ultimately we all work for um, the chance to ask their questions if they want to of us. So I would expect that to occur and then on the first week of July, which is the 5th, and hopefully the council will have time to have all of their questions answered they feel ready to go forward and pass a vote on it and cast a vote on this. 
I'll be asking the council uh, over the next 48 hours would they like to have another work session just amongst us as they consume some of this and let it marinate in their brain with the questions they might have and I'll be working with Megan on putting that together. But on behalf of um, the five of us that were here most of the time, and uh, uh, I just want all of you to know how much uh, we appreciate the time that you've invested into putting your departments together and your numbers together, and just in general what you do on behalf of all. It's, it's nothing but confirmed to me that we live in a great community, uh, and a lot of that has to do with what y'all do every day, so thank you. All right, thank you everyone.